Thank you, Mizan. That's very generous. Uh, and thanks, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm not accustomed to having anybody interested in my subject. When I go to, when I go to academic conferences, people wonder why I'm there. Uh, it, the, the analogy that I use would be if, if uh, oh, say, a British or German scholar came to the United States to study the Cherokee or the Navajo, uh, obscure indigenous tribes. So people in China wonder why I do what I do, and people in the States wonder why I do what I do. So I'm absolutely delighted that so many of you are interested in it, and I thank you for being here. My job today is a truly daunting one. Uh, I hope we're going to get to know one another very well for in the next eight hours. I've never done an eight-hour course in one day before. Usually we spread it over several weeks. So here we go. Uh, my job is to introduce you to a 1,300-year history in five lectures. So obviously this is going to be somewhat superficial. Uh, I could probably just stand here talking for days and not complete the stuff that even a superficial Western scholar could come up with. But I'll do my best. I hope that all of you will feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I'm not always clear. I might make wrong assumptions about what you do and don't know. And uh, it's perfectly legitimate to raise your hand and say, please say that again somewhat more clearly. That's perfectly all right. Please do. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm too obscure, uh, stop me. Just wave and say, mm -mm, not working, and I'll backtrack and do it again. So, my job is to introduce you to a history, but at the same time, I'm going to try to introduce you to what people say about that history. That is to say, there is a disjunction always between what serious academic historians do as we plow through documents searching for evidence and what people who are not scholars say about themselves, about others. So we're going to have images and history both intertwined here. The images of Muslims inside Chinese culture are quite varied. They differ from time to time and place to place. The social position of Muslims in China varies from time to time, from place to place, and even from person to person. One might easily find in the same Muslim community scholars of high learning and bandits. And so one must be careful not to overgeneralize. And I'm going to be waving that flag all day. Let's not overgeneralize. It's really almost impossible to say anything about Muslims in China. So what I'm going to try and do is hedge that about with academic care. The way to start that is to try and figure out the two terms about which we're speaking. That is, Muslims and China. Muslims is fairly easy until the modern period. It gets complex in the 20th century. But until then, a believer in Islam was a believer in Islam, somebody who had entered the faith or belonged to it. China, on the other hand, is a lot harder to define. You won't find that to be the case if you go to China. If you go to China, everybody will know what China is and they'll show you a map and tell you about it. But if one were to look for China on that map, wherever would it be? Gosh, no red lines enclosing countries. Just look at the topography. Let us make some fundamental definitions. China is fundamentally an agricultural civilization and people who belong to it, or at least elites who belong to it, use Chinese characters to write with and speak some version of the language or language family we call Chinese. So, <clears throat> where's China? Hmm, kind of a problem, isn't it, without those border lines? Well, since it's an agricultural civilization, we'd expect that the green parts would be more likely to be Chinese than the not green parts. So we can start on the eastern littoral and go west until we start to reach mountains. But the culture has expanded and changed over the years. There are, however, some places which are extremely unlikely to be cultural China. Now, I'm not talking about countries here. 
That's why I left the border lines out. We're not talking about countries yet. We will. But given that China is an agricultural civilization, you wouldn't expect to find people who are culturally Chinese, let's say on the Tibetan Plateau, or in the middle or even right around the Taklamakan Desert out there in the West. And indeed, you wouldn't until the 20th century. You'd find very few people out there who are culturally Chinese. Now, that's not to say that there weren't states ruling over the Chinese culture area that also ruled over parts of that. They did, but not always. So, at any given moment in time, we really do have to ask, where's China? That sounds like a silly question. Everybody knows where China is, but do we really? Inside that black line is one version of China. All right? Oh, thank you so much. That'll be very useful. Inside that black line is the shape that the state ruled from Chang'an, the capital that you see there in the northern part of that outlined uh, kingdom. That's what China, if you will, looked like when Muslims first arrived there. This is Tang China, 7th to 10th centuries. Now, I'm not going to use Hijri dates. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Uh, I'll use Gregorian dates. 7th to 10th centuries, this is usually sort of what the Tang Kingdom looked like. That little salient out toward the west sometimes was and sometimes was not part of the kingdom. It's very hard to hold on to that. Not surprising, is it? Those aren't Chinese people out there. And they don't generally like to be ruled by outsiders. So sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not. Sometimes they can hold on to it and sometimes they can't. But that's China, at, or at least it's the Tang Kingdom. How about that? That's the superstate. That's the moment in the 13th and 14th centuries when virtually everything from Korea to the gates of Vienna was ruled by a single, somewhat disunified superstate, a nomadic empire, the Mongols. This is an extraordinary moment in world history in Eurasian history, because the Mongols, by conquering everything, opened up trade, opened up communication in a way that they'd never been open before. So people moved back and forth across this world with relative safety and relative ease in a way that they couldn't have 200 years earlier and couldn't, ha and couldn't have 200 years later. So here we have the Mongol Empire. Now, you'll notice something. The Great Khanate here includes all of the Mongolian culture area, all of Korea, all of the Chinese cultural area, though it's somewhat mythical, it claims to include all of Tibet. Now, is that China? Hmm. Do we dare call it China? If so, should China always look like that? It once did, if indeed this is China. I have my doubts. I'm not sure we should call it China. I think we should call it the Great Khanate because it was ruled by a single ruler, a single master, a Mongol, who made his capital in what is the now the modern city of Beijing. Um, those of you who have read English literature have met Manchu Beijing. You probably didn't know you were doing it. How many of you can remember, in Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man? Coleridge. Xanadu is a very bad romanization of the Mongol name for Beijing. So when you, heard, when you hear that Coleridge poem, he was, of course, stoned out of his mind at the time. He was thinking of Mongol Beijing, Shangdu. And from Shangdu, he made Xanadu. Anyway, that's just a little footnote for those of you who read English literature. Anyway, this is one version of China, too. But is this China? How about that? Ah, resembles the first one, right? See that? And that? 
Very similar. This is roughly the Chinese culture area. This is roughly where people who are culturally Chinese live. Again, I'm not saying anything about contemporary countries. This is the Ming state, which ruled from the 14th until the 17th century, a three-century state that basically ruled the Chinese culture area and nothing else. Is that China? How about that? That's a monster. It's a little fanciful, too. That, that Northwestern salient never really existed. I don't know why it's there. Some nationalistic map maker got a little out of hand. Uh, but this is, this is the empire that was created between the 16th, well, 17th, early 17th and 18th centuries by another non-Chinese people, the Manchus. They came from the northeast. If you look from Beijing a little to the northeast, you'll see a long valley. The Manchus come from the east side of that valley. And in 1636, they declared a state, the Great Qing, in opposition to the Great Ming to their south. Remember, this, this is the Ming. Sorry. This is the Ming. You see Jurchen up there? The Manchus are Jurchens. They just changed their name in 1636 from Nujun or, or, or Jurchen to Manzhou or Manchu. Then they created this which is absolutely astonishing. It's one of the greatest land-based empires ever created, right up there with the Russian Empire and the United States of America. These are great landward empires, and the Qing was one of them. Now, if you cut off that northwestern salient up there, what you have left over looks remarkably like modern China. That is to say, this is the first of these Chinas that we've looked at that actually looks like the China we know now. And so they've put the, they put the border on for you very kindly. If you take that, remove that fanciful northwestern salient and the Republic of Mongolia, which sits right up at the top center there, you've got modern China. That is to say, modern China is the Qing Empire. So is that China? Well, it's more like the China we know now than anything else we've seen to date. Why am I telling you all this? What I'm trying to show you is that the history of Islam in China is inseparable from the history of China. And as China changes, so the conditions of the Muslims there change. So their relationships with the Muslim world to the West change. So their communication routes change. So their possibility of going on the pilgrimage change. And we need to pay very careful attention at each period that we study to what is China. We can't simply assume that we know what it is. Oh, stop it. Silly computer. All right. Now, for those of you who are not into Chinese studies. The next slide is simply informational. Please don't think about memorizing it today. It's totally unnecessary. These are the states that have ruled the Chinese culture area since the Hijra, that is, since the seventh century Gregorian. These are names that you're going to hear a lot of today, and I apologize for that, but that's how Chinese historians think. We think in dynasties. Now, we think that way because that's how the texts are written. The histories are generally written by or about particular dynasties. Now, what's a dynasty? As you all know, a dynasty is simply a ruling house. And as the ruling house changes, the dynasty changes. Chinese historical thinking posits a cyclical pattern of dynastic rise and fall, in which a dynasty is created on horseback by war, so the first emperor of a dynasty is always a soldier and then gradually over time degenerates. And this is always judged in Chinese historiography as a moral degeneration. 
so that the dynasty loses the right to rule, what's called in Chinese the mandate of heaven, the Tianming. As the dynasty loses the mandate of heaven, the people, usually led by yet another soldier, are entitled to rise up against an immoral authority and establish a new one. This is an immemorial pattern of dynastic rise and fall, which is solidly embedded in Chinese conceptions of history. This is how human history works. Of course, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, in at least two of these cases, the dynasty was brought down not by its own immoral quality, though that immoral quality is always argued for, but by invasion. Both the Mongol and the Manchu dynasties invaded the Chinese culture area from the north and took it by war. These are non-Chinese people, obviously. They are not culturally Chinese. And those are very traumatic moments in the history of China and, I would argue, therefore, in the history of Islam and Muslims in China. So, in my first talk, I'm going to talk about how that came to be. How did it come to be that Muslims belong in China? That's the first stage. Once we get past that, we'll be able to talk about the indigenous social processes by which Muslims who belonged in China either acculturated or resisted acculturation as their particular conditions demanded. But first, we've got to get them belonging there. And that's a long and complicated story, so I better get started. Let's start with where are the Muslims? This map is remarkably faithful to those topographic maps I showed you before. You'll notice that the dark green area to the right, this is the area occupied by people who are culturally Chinese, who would now call themselves Han. They have called themselves Han in the same way, with roughly the same meaning, for about 500 years. Before that, the meaning of the word Han changed a lot. It evolved over about a millennium. But by the middle of the Ming Dynasty, the word Han was fixed in its meaning, those who are culturally Chinese, whose elites use those characters and read those texts, and who speak versions of that language. All the rest of what we think of now as China the country is not part of the Chinese culture area. To the north, this is the territory of the Manchus and the Mongols, which stretches all the way across on the northern rim of this great country. To the far west, this is the country of Turks, uh, people who speak variants of Eastern Turkish. In Chinese, they would be called Tudria. And the Tudria people are what we would now call Turks, but not affiliated with the country Turkey, but with Turkic culture and language. The lighter green area to the southwest is, of course, Tibet. So that all around the Chinese culture area, we find the territory of non-culturally Chinese people. But inside, and this is, this is the, where we're going to spend most of our time today, inside the dark green area, do you, can you see the little black triangles? They're little black triangles scattered all over the place. Those are Muslim communities. And you'll note that they're everywhere. Indeed, throughout the eastern part of the country, there are far more of them than that. They're just too small to get their own little triangle. But they're all over the place. Um, there are 2,090-some counties in China, of which over 2,000 have Muslims in them. That is to say, there are Muslims everywhere. How did that happen? We're going to get to that. But I just wanted to show you that we're dealing with two very distinct meanings of Muslims in China. If we say Muslims in China, the country, this country, then we have to include all of those little triangles on the eastern part and all of the far northwest where there are Turkic-speaking Muslims. 
if we mean Muslims in the Chinese culture area, we're talking only about the Little Black Triangles. So I'm going to try and be really clear about that. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time in the far Northwest today. We can talk about it in Q&A. We can talk about it in informal time. But my main subject today is the Muslims who live inside the Chinese culture area. Which means, of course, that within a few generations of their arrival, if they stay, they become Sinophone. This is perfectly ordinary. One speaks the language of the place one lives. Losing the language of a distant homeland is as natural as breathing. How long does it take for South Asian Muslim families who come to London to start speaking English? And the answer is, two generations, maximum. The second generation, the generation born here, will speak English. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's as normal as breathing. That happens everywhere. You speak the language of the place you come from. Now, in olden times, when people were formally segregated into quarters, perhaps it could last another generation or two and did. We know, for example, that there were fifth and sixth generation Muslims living in China who still spoke Farsi. But they also spoke Chinese because that's where they lived. We're going to look at those processes. And we're going to look at them mainly inside the little black triangles, inside the Chinese culture area. Whenever you like, we can go out to the far northwest and talk about it. But my argument here, as you'll remember, is that that part of the world, note, is not part of the Ming state. It is part of the Yuan state, but the Yuan state isn't Chinese. The Great Khanate is not a Chinese state. It just rules China. It is only parts of it are part of the Tang state and not for very long. So that is to say that northwestern salient out there, that whole big northwestern Turkic-speaking world, is inco effectively incorporated into a China-based state for the first time by the Qing, starting not in the 17th century, but in the middle of the 18th. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time out there, unless you want to, in which case, of course, we can. The Tang. Mind you, 7th to 10th centuries. One of the most cosmopolitan cultures, possibly the most cosmopolitan culture on Earth at that period. This is, of course, the time, six, uh, 7th to 10th centuries. Europe is mired in the so-called Dark Ages. Uh, the Middle East is exploding with the energy of the Muslim empires. China long established culture has great cosmopolitan cities huge and is fascinated by the arts and the culture of the people who live to their west far from being a closed or hermetic world the tang world was wide open especially to its west goods people flowed in in fact the first Persian-speaking community in China was established not by Muslims, but by refugees from the Muslim conquest. When the Muslims took Persia, there were plenty of non-Muslim Persians who didn't like it. And they left. Where did they go? Well, if the Arabs are coming from the east, in what direction would you flee? From the west, rather. In what direction would you flee? East, of course. And many of these Farsi-speaking non-Muslims ended up in China. There was a, a Persian-speaking quarter of the Tang capital at Chang'an before there were Muslims there. These figurines represent Central Asians. On the left, a group of musicians on a camel. Obviously somewhat fanciful, but very attractive. In the middle, a foreign merchant. How do we know he's foreign? Look at the nose. Always look at the nose, because that's how you're going to figure out whether somebody's foreign or not. 
Chinese people do not have noses like that. We do. We Middle Eastern people, we have noses like that. Or at least in the eyes of Chinese people, we had noses like that. <laughs> this is a foreign merchant. Here a second one, again, with the very high bridged nose. <clears throat> this fellow is a Central Asian, but not a Muslim. How do we know he's not a Muslim? What's he selling? Wine. He's a wine peddler. So of course he's not a Muslim. He's probably a Zoroastrian or a Sogdian or some such thing. These from the same period are Chinese ceramics with Arabic inscriptions. It was not at all uncommon for Muslims living in China to create vessels of this kind, but also non-Muslims. Uh, this calligraphy is pretty awful and it may very well have been done by non-Muslim potters copying from a text. These are objects of daily use and we can only presume that they either were for Muslims to use or cre were created by Muslims as souvenirs or tourist, uh, tourist goods, exotica, if you will. And indeed, one of the ways in which people think, people who do Chinese studies think about the Tang is that it is rife with exotica, outside stuff comes to Tang, China, and people love it. They want all the foreign goods they can get their hands on. There is a fabulous book about this in English. I'm going to sprinkle my talks with bibliography because I can't help myself. I'm a teacher. Go read a book. Um, there is a wonderful book in English called The Golden Peaches of Samarkand, which is by a, an American professor who collected Tang period literature poetry and prose, even some uh, primitive drama, and gathered from that vast corpus of literature references to foreign goods. And he, does, he, he collects it by category of goods. So there's a whole chapter on incense and another chapter on dried fruit. And all of these things came from outside the Tang frontiers and were brought in to the great city of Chang'an and others for sale. It was a wide open business environment. This is Chang'an, almost certainly the greatest city in the world at the time. At its height, its population inside the walls was half a million, population outside the walls another half million. So this is a city of a million people in the eighth century. When London was a swamp, Paris wasn't much better. The greatest cities in the world were Damascus, Baghdad, and Chang'an, which was in fact far larger than any city in the Middle East. Notice the scale at the bottom. The walls were nine kilometers on a side. This is a gigantic city, and it had within it Muslim quarters. They were originally just quarters for foreigners who came from the West, who were all lumped together. The difference between Muslims and non-Muslims coming from Persia, let us say, is not obvious on the face. Westerners all look alike to the Chinese. This is a moment of shock, at least in the United States, when people who grew up there realize, oh yeah, the Chinese look all alike to us. Well, we all look alike to them. And all the people with the big noses, mm-hmm, people from the West. And they were assigned special quarters. And special markets were set up so that they would be able to have their own foodstuffs. It is likely that the earliest mosques in China were in either this city or in the great entrepot of Guangzhou in the south, none of those mosques still exist. You will be told this mosque dates from the Tang dynasty, that mosque dates from the Tang dynasty. They don't. There was probably a mosque on that site in the Tang dynasty. That is almost certain. There were mosques, but none of them still exists. The earliest existing mosques are from at least 300 years later, maybe four. So again, 
I'm, I'm going to try and distinguish what a scholarly historian would say, no, there are no Tang Dynasty mosques, from what you'll hear when you go to Guangzhou. This is a Tang Dynasty mosque. Is one of us right and one of us wrong? No, we're just saying two different things. I'm saying the building that sits there now was not built in the Tang Dynasty, and they're saying there was a mosque here in the Tang Dynasty. And both of those things are true. So Chang'an, the great city, contained mosques. It contained a Nestorian church. It contained Zoroastrian and Buddhist temples. In short, kind of like London. Everybody was there, every religion, every culture that was known to Eurasia visited Chang'an. Nobody came from Western Europe that we know of. But of course, Western Europe is a little insignificant peninsula stuck way off in the upper left-hand corner. We're not very interested in it. There's nothing worth knowing there. It is, after all, the Dark Ages. This is the Jingyun Bell. I just wanted to show you an example of craftsmanship. What blew people away, no matter where they came from to Tang China, was the artisanship. The craftsmanship of the Chinese artisans was extraordinary. And so the trade goods produced in China were valuable all over the world. If they could be transported, they would be tremendously valuable and worthy of sale just about anywhere else. And this is an example of the artistry. This is a bell that was cast in 711. And it's still hanging there in its little tower at the Forest of Stelai in the city of Xi'an. Its inscription, as you see, is a work of beautiful calligraphy cast in metal. This is a very ancient art in China and one that continues. And we find that the influences going back and forth across the continent go in both directions. One of the conceits of Chinese culture is Chinese culture just sits there. And everybody who comes into contact with it wants to be part of it. And therefore, anybody who comes to China becomes Chinese. This ignores the other half of the equation. That is to say, things from outside of China that come to China and transform China. This is just one physical example. On the left, you see a Central Asian guitar-like instrument. On the right, a Chinese version. Now, you see the exquisite artisanship here, but it's the same instrument. Comes from Central Asia. Chinese artisans start to make them. They start to be used, and the pipa arises. Now, we usually associate this trade between East Asia and the Middle East with the Silk Road, which is a landward road, stretching basically from Damascus or from Persia to China. It's not as ever a single road. It's always a network of roads. There's no single Silk Road. It should always be Silk Roads. But we talk about the Silk Road as a network. There was a second way to do this, and it's very important for the history of Islam and Muslims in China, and that is the maritime route that you see before you. One of the extraordinary creations of the first Islamic centuries was a network of commercial trading ports that stretched literally from Spain to China. You could follow these routes because it didn't stop there in northern Egypt. It went across the peninsula and across the Mediterranean as well. Because remember, the Maghreb and Spain were Muslim kingdoms at this time. And so that sea route actually goes from Spain to China. And you could use a single language throughout, and that was Farsi. That was the lingua franca of the great trade routes. So that if you could speak Farsi, you could go literally from the Maghreb to China without having to learn another language. Enormously convenient for merchants and incredibly lucrative. We need to look at the kinds of trade goods that, that Muslim merchants carried. What's the best kind of long-distance 
trade good. It should be light in weight and high in value per unit weight. That's the way trade goods should be. So what sorts of things would we be thinking of here? Oh, precious stones, jade, especially carved jade objects, precious metals, Materia medica, we don't usually think of that, but drugs, medicinal plants, which are always dried for long distance trade and usually grow in relatively delimited areas. So that the materia medica of point A probably don't grow in point B, especially if A and B are as distant as Persia and Eastern China. Those materia medica flowed in small ships, but capable of this kind of coasting trade. The, the lines across the Indian Ocean are probably not all that accurate. In all likelihood, the ships that sailed these routes stayed very close to the coast. It was way too scary out there in the middle. So you stay close to the coast. And so Bangladesh, for example, would be included in these routes, as would the northwestern coast of what is now India, as would Thailand, the west side coast of mainland Southeast Asia. All of those parts would be included in these lengthy journeys. It would be very rare for one ship to make the trip. Most ships most were very small, and they went from one port to the next, transshipped their goods, sold them in the market there, and went back with the goods of that place. So they would move between two or at most three of these ports, but the goods kept on going. So Materia Medica or incense, especially frankincense, moved from the Persian Gulf to China in a number of different ships. And of course, at each transshipment, as all you economists will know, the price gets higher. So by the time they arrive at their final destination, whether it's an east destination or a west destination, the price is enormous. These are truly exotica. These are luxury goods from afar. Whether it's the golden peaches of Samarkand or the blood-sweating horses of Fergana on the north side or incense and precious stones in Guangzhou or Yangzhou, this is the, the world of Muslim traders and it is huge. So we're not seeking knowledge even unto China, though that is what the, the Hadith would ask us to do. We are seeking profit even unto China, and the Chinese merchants are seeking profit even unto Jiddah. The city of Quanzhou is not usually known as a famous city in China. It's here on the southeast coast, here. But in these early days, in the Tang and Song periods, Quanzhou was the Muslim capital of the Chinese culture area. This is where you would find the most Muslims. And here we have two of the oldest, actually still standing, Islamic antiquities in the Chinese culture area. On the left, we have the gate of a mosque. The mosque itself is in ruins and hasn't been used for a very long time, probably seven or eight centuries. But the tombstones on the right still stand in a Muslim cemetery. There is still a Muslim cemetery in Tranjo. There, there are hardly any Muslims. And that's a very interesting story that I'll tell you later on. But there is a Muslim cemetery. Fujian. Yes. Yes. In fact, the Fujianese case is one that I'll be referring to pretty often. Precisely because having been a major Muslim center in the Tang and Sung periods, and in the Yuan, by the Ming, because of the prohibition on sea travel and seaward commerce that occurred in the middle of the 15th century, or the late 15th century, all of these ports were completely cut off from contact with other Muslims. And within a century or two, they had stopped being Muslims. They were the descendants of Muslims. And it's a fascinating story that we'll talk about in a little while. These are Song dynasty terms. The, the, the Song follows the Tang from the 10th 
to the 13th centuries. The Song, uh, like the Tang, is an indigenous dynasty. Its, its emperors were Chinese, but it too traded considerably with the peoples to its north, west, and south, including Muslims. And by this point, there were Muslims who had lived in the Chinese culture area for generations. These terms appear in Song Dynasty legal texts. Tu Sheng Fan Ke and Wu Shi Fan Ke, native born foreign sojourners and fifth generation foreign sojourners. These are legal categories. These people have special obligations and privileges vis a vis the Song state. They are not the same as just foreigners, but they remain Ke. That last Chinese character there means guests. It means people who, are, who come with the intention of returning. However, if you've been there five generations, the chances of your returning are getting slimmer and slimmer. It's not likely to happen. And so these people occupy a special legal space between actual foreigners who come and go and indigenes who are treated differently. These are legal categories, and we, thus we know that there were Muslims who had been there for a long time. We know they were Sinophone. We have some texts written by these people in Chinese, but we know that they also continued to use Farsi as their lingua franca because they played the role of middlemen. The goods that came into the Chinese ports were traded through these Muslim mer merchants to Chinese merchants for distribution within the empire. Rarely did the Muslims leave the trading ports. So even in the Song period, we find Islam and Muslims limited to those places that were engaged in transcultural trade, whether on the landward side through the caravan trade to the west or on the seaward side through that giant Muslim trading network that I described to you before. These are mosques. Pretty interesting. In fact, the Feng Huang Si, the Phoenix Mosque in Hangzhou, contains one of possibly two or three of the oldest actual mosque constructions remaining in China. Uh, there's, a, there's a wall inside the Feng Huang Temple, which is in fact a Song Dynasty wall. The rest of the mosque, of course, is later, but that wall remains as a relic of this very old community. Hangzhou became the capital of the southern Song dynasty. The Song was driven from its northern Chinese capital in 1227, uh, excuse me, in 1127 um, by northern invaders, uh, pre-Mongols, if you will. And this became the capital. Marco Polo, of course, went there under the Mongols, but it was still, at that time, the, the very recent capital of the Southern Song, and at that time, again, the, the largest city in the world. Uh, this was a time when Venice, Marco Polo's hometown, probably had a population of 50,000. The population of Hangzhou was one and a half million. He'd never seen anything like it. He was completely boggled. If you want to read Marco Polo at his most hyperbolic, read his discussion of Hangzhou. He said, people, you have never seen anything like this. The markets each day bring in enough food to feed Venice for a year. It, it, it simply astonished him. Now, Hangzhou lies in the Jiangnan region, the lower Yangtze region of China, where virtually everything is done by boat. And as you know, it's much easier to move large cargoes like bulk grain, such as rice, by boat than it is by land. And so the Jiangnan region was the center of an enormous commerce in everything from these exotica from abroad to rice, the most basic food of the everyday. Hangzhou was astonishing, and it did have a Muslim community. However, it remained a ke, a sojourner community. It was not yet considered indigenous. And here comes Chinggis Khan. Temujin, born 
in Mongolia for reasons that have to do with his own family, perhaps even his own psychology, but also the conditions in the northern nomadic steppe at that time, gathered together a snowballing army of horse-mounted soldiery that became the nucleus of the greatest land empire the world has ever known. There's never been anything like the Mongol Empire. Uh, I showed you a map of it before. It stretched literally from Korea to Eastern Europe. It conquered hunks of the Middle East, but failed to conquer some others. Uh, they were the cause of one of the oddest alliances ever known between uh, the, uh, the Sultan at Baghdad and the King of France, who got together to fight the Mongols. These guys were, according to the texts that we have, both Christian and Muslim texts, the scourge of God. They came upon us for our sins, and they conquered us. That's the Mongol Empire. There's never been anything like it. And I suppose we should all be grateful for that. The Empire of the Great Khans, based up at Karakoram, and the Yuan Dynasty, separating those two is a Chinese fiction. They were, in fact, the same thing. They were ruled from Beijing once Chinggis's grandson, Hublai, completed the conquest of the Chinese culture area. This was gigantic. Fortunately for the people that were conquered, it very quickly split into no fewer than four large khanates, as you see, the Yuan on the east, Chagatai, Ilkhan, and Golden Horde. Again, you must remember to combine these two. Chagatais ruled the Kazakh steppe, the Ilkhans ruled Persia, the Golden Horde ruled what is now Russia. A most extraordinary conquest. And for Muslims, an amazing opportunity. After conquering the Jin, which was northern China, and the Sung in southern China, the Mongols employed Central Asian and Persian Muslims as administrators, court merchants, and soldiers. They were all included in the category Sumuran, people of various categories, and placed in a social hierarchy above the Chinese. Often misinterpreted as meaning people with colored eyes, because the Chinese characters here at the bottom can be interpreted as to mean colored eye people, but in fact that's not what they meant at all. It meant people of various categories. People will tell you about the colored eyes thing. Just smile and say thank you. Uh, that's not what it means, but never mind. This term brought honor to the Muslims under Mongol rule, but of course the Mongols didn't last. They were defeated and driven out in the 14th century. Sumuren is a very important category in Muslim history in China precisely because it was an alliance between foreign Muslims, not the old merchants of the, treat of the uh, trading ports, but a new set brought mostly from Central Asia to the purpose by the Mongols to help them govern China. Why? Because the Muslims were literate. They had Persian. They could keep records. The Mongols had to invent a written language for, themself, for themselves, and nobody much other than Mongols ever learned it. And so it was very important to have literates to help govern the vast Chinese culture area, and we really don't want to let them govern themselves. Should you ever conquer a country, you're going to have to decide whether to allow the indigenous people to govern themselves or whether you're going to have other people govern them. If you have enough people of your own, that's fine, but what if you don't? Bring Central Asians and create a special category for them, the Sumuren. This is a Sumuren. Not an attractive fellow. But the representations of the Sumuran ranged from the completely honorable to the completely depraved, depending on who was doing the perceiving. We must take all such things with a grain of salt. Yes? Sir, are you saying the court records in those days in Farsi? Some of them were. The daily records were often in Farsi, 
the official records were kept in Mongolian and Chinese. And indeed, the histories that most people read of this period are the Chinese ones. There are some Mongolian histories that are worthwhile, but possibly the greatest history of the Mongols was written by a Persian in Persian, uh, Rashid ad-Din's uh, History of the World Conqueror, which has been translated into English. This is one of the nastier poems written about the Muslims during this period, right toward the end of the Mongol period when their rule was quite shaky and the court was in disrepute, especially in southern China. A southern Chinese wrote this poem. Their elephant noses gone all flat, their cat's eyes dulled, all their hopes for a long life gone. Alas, when the tree falls, the monkeys scatter. And this, of course, is a reference to the Mongol dynasty and the fate of its Muslim servants when the dynasty goes. This is the fellow that drove them out, the Mong drove the Mongols out, possibly the ugliest emperor China has ever had, Zhu Yuanzhang, the first emperor of the Ming dynasty. He was a Buddhist monk, but he gathered an army at a time when the Mongol rule was disintegrating administratively, and that army snowballed, the war escalated, and they were successful in driving the Mongols back north. Most of the Mongols left, some stayed. Most of the Sumu stayed. So what are we gonna do with these people? They are clearly not us. We've made our business, we've created a new dynasty on the basis of driving them out. What are we gonna do with the them who remain? Especially those among the Muslims and the other Sumu, because Sumu were not all Muslims. There were non-Muslims among them as well. What are we going to do with the Sumu who remain? Well, what's the easiest way to make sure that these people no longer constitute an other, a different sort of people? As all of you know, intermarriage. Assimilate them in the domestic realm of the household. These are statutes from the Ming Code. This is actually from the law code. Mongols and Sumu who live in China may marry Chinese women, but may not marry from among their own kind. In other words, you must intermarry. However, there are Chinese who do not wish to marry Hui Hui, that is Muslims, and Kipchaks. So these Sumu are not included in the prohibition. So most Sumu must Mar and Mongols must marry Chinese. For the Hui Hui and the Kipchaks, we will make an exception. Now that sounds nice, it sounds generous, it sounds benevolent. Then you read the substatute and find out why. Hui Hui, that is Muslims, are shaggy with big noses. Kipchaks have light hair and blue eyes. What could be more disgusting than that? Ugh. Their appearance is vile and peculiar. So there are those who do not wish to marry them. Mongols and Sumu may not marry among their own kind, but the Kipchaks and the Hui Hui are the vilest among the Sumu, and a Chinese will not want to marry them. They may marry from their own kind. Allowing them to marry each other is in sympathy for their possible extinction, should they not be allowed to do so. Now that's really nice. But this is direct from the law code. The Ming were very conscious about wanting to assimilate the Sumu and the Mongols who had ruled over them for over a century and who were the targets of their military and then cultural wrath. The Hui Hui get accepted from this because they are just so ugly. Now we come to, yeah, sorry. Yes. But the Muslims worked for the Mongols. They were their trustees, they were their servants, and they remained different. Remember the noses and the, and, the, and the eyes? They were still different. They were still not us. I understand, but yeah. why 
Well, actually, they treated them, in, this, in the case of the statute, they treated them a bit better. The Mongols had to marry Chinese. The Muslims could marry one another. They could marry one another because they were so ugly, but they could nonetheless marry one another. So it, the Mongols and the Sumul were treated almost as a single category of people. Okay, I didn't go into this, but I will. Uh, when the Mongols conquered the Chinese culture area and set up a Chinese named dynasty, which ruled over the Chinese culture area, the Tibetan culture area, hunks of the Turkic and Mongolian culture areas, and also the great Khanate at Karakorum, in other words, after the life of Kublai, they set up a four-part ethnic hierarchy in China. Mongols at the top, Sumu second, people of the northern part of China third, and people from the southern part of China fourth. That is to say, they did not recognize anything that we would call the Han people. What we would call the Han people, they used that name just for northerners. Southerners were called Man, barbarians. Southern Chinese, well, first of all, those people will eat anything. And I mean anything. So, you know, they're, they're obviously beyond the pale of civilization. But they recognized northern and southern Chinese as two different ethnic groups. This is part of the evolution of this idea of the Han people, which takes another couple of centuries. So, with that hierarchy in mind, if people of the last two categories drive out the rulers, those among the ruling classes, which includes both the Mongols and the Sumu, who stay, are going to be the targets of opprobrium. And that's precisely what's going on. No, they're treating them better. And they're not worse. They're just uglier. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's why a Chinese won't want to marry them. Remember, Mongols, Mongols are at, le at least have small noses. Uh, they have flat faces and they're ugly, but they're not that ugly compared to Sumu. Yeah. The Kipchaks. The Kipchaks, we think, again, these ethnonyms are very difficult to locate, are probably people who would now be called Volga Tatars. They're the descendants of Vikings, truth be told, who sailed down the Volga and committed rapine and pillage all along the route. Uh, but there are, as I'm sure you know, there are lots of light-eyed, red-haired Russians. Same folks. But these were Tatars. They were Muslims, uh, or some of them were Muslims. And they got singled out as being ugly because of their light-colored eyes. The, the Huehue Muslims were the Turks and the Persians, who had dark hair, of course, and dark eyes, but were nonetheless almost unbelievably ugly. Primarily, but not all. Now we come to the most famous Muslim of all. This is the most famous Chinese Muslim. This is, of course, not what he looked like at all. You will never see an accurate picture of Zheng He because nobody knows what he looked like. We do know he was big and fat. But beyond that, mm. and he was big. we know he was big because uh, one of the emperors of the, Qing, of the Ming dynasty was one of his buddies. He had served the young prince who later became the Yongle Emperor. And because of that, we know a little about him. We know he was tall from other accounts. We know he was fat because he was a eunuch. And eunuchs all, or almost all, got fat. So he was a Muslim eunuch servant of the Yongle Emperor who happened to have a special talent for organizing large naval expeditions. And he did so with tremendous effectiveness. He was an extraordinary admiral of the fleet. Nobody like him has ever existed in China before or since. He and his, and his ships sailed from several southeastern Chinese ports. Well, I'll show you where they sailed. There. That is all over the place. Basically, wherever you could go in the, in the world of the monsoon, they went. Now, why is the monsoon significant here? Sorry, I have to stay by the microphone. 
The monsoon is significant because of the nature of sails. This is a technological issue. In the world of the monsoon, which is basically this, the, Indian o the Arabian Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, and the South China Sea, this is the world of the monsoon, the winds are extraordinarily predictable. The monsoon blows six months from southwest to northeast and six months from northeast to southwest. So if you want to go anywhere in this world, you can always do it sailing before the wind. You never have to sail against the wind because that you, know, you know that within a few months it's going to turn around and you can sail back again. Therefore, they had no need for the kinds of elaborate sailing apparatus that the Arabs of the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf or the Mediterranean needed or that later, borrowing from the Arabs, the Southern Europeans did. One of the, th the things, and I'm sure you all learned this when you first heard about Christopher Columbus in 1492 sailing the ocean blue and all that, they could sail against the wind. That's what made th those ships so extraordinary. They could sail in the Atlantic which is a world of very unpredictable and changeable winds. This is not. So Zheng He's ships all could sail no more than 30 degrees off the wind because they had huge bamboo lathing sails that could only be turned like that around the mast. There was no way to sail against the wind because you didn't have to. That simple technological fact explains why when Christopher Columbus went from Europe to the so-called New World, Dominica, in 1492, he had three itty-bitty ships, the largest of which was about 110 feet long. That largest of the three ships could easily have fit on the main deck of one of Zheng He's ships and he had 64 of them. Christopher Columbus's fleet carried a few hundred men, if that. Zheng He's fleets, the largest of them, carried 30,000 men. These were gigantic expeditions. Uh, this map, too, is a little fanciful. We have absolutely no evidence that Zheng He's people ever went south of Mogadishu. But still, that's a pretty amazing achievement when you think about it. Sailing from eastern China to Mogadishu and back is not something anybody was capable of doing in 1413, which is when he did it. And he did it with a giant fleet. He and his Muslim commanders, sub-commanders, went on the Hajj because they were there. But they also conducted diplomacy and trade throughout this world. We still don't have a definitive explanation of why the Ming Empire was willing to spend vast quantities on these expeditions. Many theories have been advanced. It's probable that some of them are correct, more than one, that this wasn't a single purpose thing. But seven times these great fleets sailed out of the eastern Chinese ports. And one of them made it as far as Mogadishu. That's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. What the we don't really know. The troops were certainly Chinese. Some of them may have been Muslims. We don't know that. We know that some of the commanders were Muslims because we have stories of them interpreting in Persian. And we have a remarkable document from one of them, Ma Huan, who was, I think, second or third in command of the fleet was a Chinese Persian speaker, a Muslim, and he left us a truly remarkable diary that has been translated into English, so you can read it. Uh, and it, it's, it's written in Chinese. So we do know an enormous amount about what happened on these. Ma Huan, M-A space H-U-A-N. Now, I don't know how popular it became, um, but there was a book done by an Englishman, I think, called something like 1421. Yeah, yeah. Nope. 
They didn't. These guys had been sailors all their lives. They kept diaries which we have. Do you think it likely that they would have sailed across the Pacific going eastward without noticing? Mm -mm. They would have told us if they'd done that, and they don't tell us that. I'm afraid that there is absolutely no evidence that Zheng He's voyages went anywhere other than along these routes, because those were the routes they knew. Why would they leave the familiar trading world? What would be the point of going eastward having no idea what was out there? They followed the standard routes. They were trading. They were doing diplomacy. Now, one of the, one of the images that's conveyed in the Chinese historiography of this is that Zheng He's expeditions were entirely peaceful. Unlike those bad, bad European imperialists who went out and conquered and so on, we Chinese, we don't do that sort of thing. Well, I have a question. Why the 29,000 troops? They were, in fact, engaged in diplomacy by force. And on a number of occasions, they landed those troops and enforced their own solutions in local conflicts, which, as you know, Powerful countries often enforce their solutions on local conflicts using troops for entirely peaceful purposes. Think about that. So here we are. It's time to stop. I'm way over time. So uh, can, we take, can we take about five minutes for Q&A and then we'll take a break. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Only to sail with the wind. No. <laughs> the question is, were there ways to sail across the Pacific only being able to sail with and not against the wind? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the prevailing winds in some parts of the Pacific are west to east. But they're not constant, and they do change, especially once you get to the eastern Pacific. The Eastern Pacific is notorious for changeable winds. Uh, the coasts of both North and South America are very dangerous places to sail, as British and American and Spanish and, uh, and some, even some Russian ships found to their cost. So uh, Zheng He's fleet simply couldn't have done it. Yes? It sounds like they were very, it sounds very, oh, oh I'm, yeah. Um, it sounds very, um, how did, like, the, I want to know about the history of um, names of Muslims. Okay. Um, uh, Muslims, like immigrants to any society, uh, brought names with them, and in the course of X generations, and depending on the situation we can identify X, would take local names as well. And the custom of giving Muslims, Muslim children, what are called Jingming, uh, scriptural names or Quranic names and Chinese names is at least three or four hundred years old. So uh, most of the famous Muslims that we know from China have both Chinese and Arabic names. So that the guy whose biography I'm currently writing is Yusuf Majul. Uh, one of the Sufis I'll introduce you to later is Ab Abul Futuh Malaitshe. So Having both is, we presume, ordinary, but very often we don't know both of them because only one would have been recorded in a particular kind of text. So in, in Islamic texts written in Persian or Arabic, in Ibn Battuta, for example, or in, um, in any of the, in uh, Al-Siraf, or any of the other traveling accounts of China by Islamic, by Muslim authors, only Arabic or Persian names would appear. Whereas in the Chinese texts, usually only Chinese names appear. So both are, I mean, I have two names. I have a Hebrew name and an English name. And that was perfectly normal in the Jewish community I grew up in in the United States. And it's perfectly normal in Muslim communities in China to have one of each. One more question? Yes, ma'am. Could I ask 
ask you to look uh, to uh, see the um, map of Chang'an again, please. Sure, of course. And could you show us where the Muslim quarters were and where mm. the mosques were? Uh, there were mosques, were. but we do not know where they were. Uh, we know where they are now. Uh, there are still there is still a, a very wonderful mosque in Xi'an, which is the the the, the successor to Chang'an, and I can show you that mosque in a little while. But it was built in the Ming, not in the Tang. Uh, I actually can't show you where the Muslim quarter is because I don't know. Was it inside? It was inside the wall. Yes, yeah. yes. And I've I've always presumed it was near either the eastern or the western market, because the Muslims were traders, but. It wasn't a Muslim quarter specifically. There would have been a mosque and the Muslims would have lived around it, but it would have been a foreigner's quarter. Other Westerners, and here's the great irony, of course, Westerners in Tang China meant Muslims or Persians, non-Muslims perhaps, Sogdians and so on. The whole idea that Westerners come from Europe, we'd probably call them far Westerners, but Westerners meant folks from the Middle East. I don't know where the quarter was, I'm sorry. I'm just not, I'm not a Tang Dynasty aficionado. I could find out for you if you'd like. Uh, I've put, I think I've put my email at the front of each lecture, so please feel free to write to me with questions that I don't know the answers to now. I'll be glad to find them. Okay, we should stop and take a break. One more question. Yes. Was it common for Ming period admirals to be eunuchs? And um, what was the reason behind this? No. Uh, admirals generally were, soldiers generally were not eunuchs. But those who served directly in the, court, in the personal inner court of the emperor had to be eunuchs. Anyone who got beyond the barrier into the inner court had to be a eunuch because there may have been either contact or opportunity for contact with the royal women. And so eunuchs had a very particular purpose in the inner court. Now Zheng He was probably made a eunuch as a child and uh, served as the personal person, the, a servant of the prince, one of the members of the royal house. And by luck, Zheng He's luck, that prince happened to become the Yongle emperor. Uh, a lot of other princes were killed or exiled or imprisoned or just spent their days carousing inside the palace. But this guy actually became the emperor. And when he did so, Zheng He's position automatically became one of enormous privilege and power. As you all know, anybody who has access to the ear of an autocrat has power. It's all about access. And these two had been intimate friends. Uh, for a long time. So Zheng He's rise to being admiral of the fleet was in some ways despite the fact that he was a eunuch. Most of the eunuchs served inside the palace. Now, you'll recall we were in the, in the mid-Ming, the 15th century, the voyages of Zheng He. After those voyages ceased in the, in the 1430s, uh, two developments occurred that cut off most of the communication between the Chinese cultural world and the Muslim worlds to its west uh, with, with great efficiency. You'll recall that this is the Ming state. The seaside trade came through Guangzhou and, and Quanzhou here and Fuzhou here. The landside trade to Xi'an and Luoyang and Kaifeng. Kaifeng was the terminus of the landside Silk Road uh, up through the Ming period. But after the 1430s, the Ming state gradually withdrew from the seaside trade. In fact, they forbade it. The main reason for this was piracy. There were huge numbers of pirates out there who are almost always, and I think quite unfairly called, Japanese pirates, Wokou. And the Wokou were in fact mostly Chinese. Some were Koreans, some were Japanese. But they 
Uh, they controlled whole stretches of the island country from Taiwan northward all the way to the Korean Peninsula and the Ryukyu Islands. They were ferocious and their predilection was for raiding coastal communities. So the Ming could have answered this threat with a number of different kinds of, uh, of policy. They could have strengthened the navy, for example, and built a kind of coasting navy to fight off these pirates. Instead, they chose to leave the coast to the pirates and force the population of the coast inland. They, they literally moved the population inland to prevent them from being raided. And so the seaside trade was cut off. And at the very same time, the Timurids, Timurilang, Tamerlane, and his descendants arose in Central Asia and essentially prevented the Ming on its northwestern side from being in close touch with the world to its west. That combination forced the Ming back on its own resources, those of the Chinese culture area here, and indeed were one of the causes, the landward side evolutions, of the building of the Great Wall. The Great Wall of China is usually associated with the Qin Dynasty and is held to be 2,000 years old. Most of the existing wall is Ming. That is to say, 15th century. Very little of the ancient Qin wall remained at this point. The whole wall basically had to be rebuilt. And they did. In order to keep out the remnant Mongols to the north, Tibetans to the west, Turks to the northwest. These were threatening peoples, the Turks especially. Uh, there are lots of wonderful stories about uh, not Tamerlane himself, but his son, Shahrukh Bahadur, corresponding with the Ming court in one of those fabulous medieval correspondences in which the translation process ensured that neither side knew what the other was saying. Uh, fabulous examples of miscommunication there. But in the end, these two great powers, uh, the Timurids based in what is now Afghanistan and the Ming court at Beijing agreed, having thrown accusations at one another of the nastiest kind. The Ming, of course, called these people uncivilized barbarians, and the, uh, the Timurids called the Ming unbelievers, too stubborn and stupid to accept Islam. And between the two of them, they really didn't understand one another at all, but they did agree after a lengthy correspondence not to use the language of superior and inferior, but to use the language of brothers. They really didn't have any choice because neither could conquer the other. When Tamerlane died, he was in the process of organizing a giant army to conquer China. Why would he want to do that? And the answer is, it was the richest place on earth. The goods, the agriculture, the wealth of the Ming was not just legendary, it was real. And the Timurids, had they conquered China, really would have been rivals to the Mongols in terms of power and wealth, but they, they never did. But they did negotiate and communicate with one another, and we do have some of those letters translated into English. In any case, the Ming state, after the rise of the Timurids and of the pirates on the southeast coast, was cut off in ways that we usually associate with Chinese history in general, but that's inaccurate, as I hope I've demonstrated. In this period, it's accurate. China, the Chinese culture area really was cut off from its neighbors to the south, west, and north. What happens when Muslim communities are cut off from contact with the Islamic world? Well, one of the things that you would expect to happen would be fairly rapid acculturation. That is, the rise of generations that do not know the tradition in the same way as their grandparents or great-grandparents had. You would expect that, and indeed that's what happens. In the late 16th century, a fellow called Hu Dangzhou, who came from Xi'an here, Hu Dangzhou was exceedingly worried about the acculturation of 
his community of Muslims in the Way River Valley. The children weren't, weren't learning Islam. How are we going to deal with that? So he went west. He actually went to the Middle East. He went on the Hajj and stayed and studied and brought back texts and developed a way of teaching Islam inside the Chinese cultural context. We don't know an awful lot about it, unfortunately, but we do know that it involved giving, giving the Friday sermon, for example, and doing some of the Quranic teaching, some of the religious school teaching in Chinese. Now that's quite innovative. And that, but of course it's not at all unusual elsewhere in the Muslim world. Giving, giving the sermon in the local language that people will understand makes good sense. This language is, of course, interspersed with lots of Arabic. And so the children did learn Arabic in school, but they also were instructed in Chinese. And this complex mixed language system came to be called in Chinese, Jing Kang Jiao Yu, Scripture Hall Education. And this is a picture of a contemporary Jing Tang Jiao Yu school in which the teachers sit and talk with the youngsters in Chinese, interspersed with Arabic. But the education is in fact in the Chinese language, which is the only language the children understand. Now, that, that this didn't take place until the late 16th century will give you some idea of the power of the Islamic languages within these communities. They really lasted. Remember that by this point, there had been, been Muslims in China for 800 years. So for 800 years, Farsi and Arabic formed the substance of education, even if people did speak Chinese at home. But by the late 16th century, people like Hu, Zhang, Hu Dangzhou were worried enough about this to develop a system of education that was indigenous. There were other ways of adapting as well. This is one of my favorite topics, but it's one about which we can't actually say much. Those of you who can read Arabic, try this on. The first line's easy, right? Try the second one or the third. This is Chinese, but it's Chinese written with the al Arabic alphabet. In other words, it's transliteration. This is a phonetic rendering of Chinese using the Arabic alphabet, what would be called in modern Chinese pinyin, representing the sound. Now, phonetic representations of Chinese are exceedingly difficult to do because Chinese is pronounced so differently across the vast land of the Chinese culture area. These are what are called in modern English dialects, but in fact they're mutually incomprehensible languages. Cantonese, Beijing language, and Gansu language are not mutually comprehensible. This happens to be a rendering of Gansu, Chinese, into the Arabic alphabet, and it's very old. Is this part of a manuscript? Or? It is a manuscript, yes. This is a, this is a letter, but it's a, uh, it's a method of writing that could only exist under very specific conditions. That is, people who spoke Chinese but didn't read or write it, and who read and wrote Arabic but didn't speak it. Under that condition, this makes perfect sense. It's called Xiaojin, and it is a very little known phenomenon, but it's probably the first phonetic representation of Chinese. Chinese, as you know, is written non-phonetically. Chinese characters have no inherent phonetic value. They're called ideographs, yes. What's the general educational level of the population? The Muslim population? It depends on where you are. Uh, in the Jiangnan region, there was much higher literacy. In a place like, a very poor place like Gansu, much lower. We don't have any statistics before the 20th century. But Evelyn Roski has reconstructed this to the point that she can make a pretty good guess that in the Jiangnan region, in a wealthy, highly cultured region, 
the lower Yangtze, you might have as high as 25% literacy, including a fair number of women. Whereas in a place like Gansu, Chinese language literacy might be as low as 2%. Uh, but in Gansu, or in other places with substantial concentrations of Muslims, of course, the children learn to read Arabic in the mosque. They had to, to learn to pray. And so they could read the Arabic alphabet and learned to reproduce it in writing, but they couldn't speak it. Their native language was Chinese, which they could neither read nor write. Therefore, we get this. Yes, ma'am. Precisely. That's, that happens a little later. When there's a, the, the question is whether, there, whether it went the other way. Did people ever use Chinese characters to transliterate Arabic? And the answer is yes, they did. And we do have some printed texts in which we see Arabic with Chinese transliteration and then Chinese translation. So it was very clear that people, um, for example, salam. How do you represent salam to a person who can only read Chinese? You use three characters, sa, liang, mu. Sa, liang, mu. The ng, the ng sound, substitutes for the long a. So salam, sa, liang, mu. That's as close as you can get in Chinese. Uh, and it did, it, yes, we do have printed texts of that kind, but they're somewhat later. This is, the, we know that Xiao Jin was created in the late Ming. That is, in the, in, probably in the 16th century. And it continued to be used into the 20th. Uh, I've never met anybody who used it, but my teachers did. And uh, they knew that there were some old uh, imams. I'll, I'll use the Chinese word for imam from now on. I'll call them ahong. Ahong is, is Persian ahund, again, transliterated into Chinese. Ahong is universal in China for imam for a religious teacher. So ahong, uh, ahong, the old ahongs still exist who can do this. So this is, this is an adaptation in the same way that, that Scripture Hall education is an adaptation to a particular cultural environment and to the anxiety that Islam would be lost. If you can't transmit it, it will be lost. How to transmit it, how to teach how to communicate. These are crucial issues. This is a, a piece of the Quran translated into Chinese below in, in, in characters, but also with the Xiao Jin pronunciation. So this is uh, how you would, you would read it in Arabic, you would then read the Arabic letters which would tell you the Chinese, and then Translated. So this was a textbook. The whole Quran was never translated into Chinese before the late 19th century, but pieces were as textbooks for children. Sorry, I'm having a little technology moment here. <laughs> okay. Okay. What other adaptations can we find? Obviously, one adapts to the cultural environment in which one lives. Everybody does that. And the question is, how? And especially for immigrant communities, the how contains a very large number of variables. The most obvious of which is, how can we stay ourselves inside this alien environment? And what happens when the environment becomes less and less alien and we come to belong here? In that case, a cultural interrogation is necessary. What is the core of being us? What do we have to preserve in order to stay ourselves inside an atmosphere which is usually not unfamiliar? Indeed, it might even be our culture. If you're a Sinophone person, you are a participant in Chinese culture. But what does it mean to be a Muslim 
inside that, a simultaneous insider and outsider? What is the essence of being a Muslim that must be preserved? So let me show you a couple of examples from architecture. These are mosques. They look like Chinese temples, don't they? Yes, they do. What's the difference? Well, obviously the absence of statuary, the absence of representation would be a major difference. Uh, I remember going into a mosque in China, I think this was my first trip, and maybe in 1982. I'd lived in Taiwan before this, but the atmosphere was very different. The first time I went to China was 1982. And I was traveling with a group from Hangzhou University, which included their foreign affairs representative, the Wai Ban. He was a middle-aged gentleman who had been educated in Russian in the 1950s, which is how he got to be a foreign affairs rep. And he was, he was traveling around with this gang of rowdy Americans led by me. And uh, we went to the Great Mosque in Xi'an, because one always does. Uh, that's on the, the two pictures at the top are the Great Mosque in Xi'an, probably the best example of Ming Dynasty mosque architecture that still exists. And we went into the prayer hall. First of all, he really didn't want to take his shoes off. And we said, sorry, you have to take your shoes off. And he said, no, why should I take my shoes off? And sooner or later we persuaded him that he would not be allowed to go into the prayer hall with his shoes on, so he did reluctantly leave his shoes behind. And he went into the prayer hall and started poking around. It was not a prayer time, of course. There was nobody there. And he started poking around in the mihrab. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for the statues. Where are the statues? Can't have a temple without statues. And I told him, there are no statues. Sorry. He said, what kind of religion is that without statues? He really couldn't comprehend it at all because he'd never been in a mosque before. He had no idea. So beyond the absence of statues, what would differentiate this mosque from an ordinary Chinese temple? And it is obvious to any Chinese person who walks into it that there is a major difference. Chinese temples, especially on a large scale like this one, are always oriented north to south. You enter at the south end, the prayer hall is at the north end. Mosques in China, of course, are always oriented east to west. The mihrab must be on the western side of the prayer hall. This baffles Chinese folks. This makes absolutely no sense. Why would you do that? Temples are always north to south. Be sensible. But Muslim mosques, of course, are not. And so any Chinese going into this temple complex would know he was on slightly alien soil because of the wrong orientation. Any Muslim, of course, would know exactly what was going on. To the bottom, we see a, a rural mosque. Uh, the, the upper mosque, the, the great mosque in, in Xi'an, is very urban. It's right at the heart of the Muslim quarter of Xi'an, which is ancient Chang'an. That Muslim quarter, incidentally, is still there. If you want to go to, if you go to Xi'an on a tour, you will inevitably be taken to the Great Mosque. It's an absolutely standard part of every tourist deal that goes to Xi'an, precisely because of its architectural marvelousness. It really is gorgeous. And it's a big tourist site, which is one of the reasons why the Muslim Quarter hasn't been torn down for urban renewal. The Muslim Quarter is still there because it surrounds the Great Mosque, which is such a great tourist attraction. And of course, many of the Muslims now sell tourist trinkets because of the hundreds of thousands of people who walk through their quarter every year. The vast majority of them, incidentally, Chinese. We think of tourists in China as foreigners, but well over 90% of the tourists in China are Chinese, domestic. So those folks walk through and they buy souvenirs like crazy because to non-Muslim Chinese, this is a very exotic place. It's very weird. Anyway, a rural mosque is obviously a very different sort of place, but it, it, it nonetheless... Yeah, oh, sorry. I didn't see a big mess there in the Hangzhou city in the mosque and the building. Was there a tradition of calling the Azan publicly? Oh, yes. There was, but in the city of Xi'an, it had been given up 
precisely because it was seen as so outlandish and the neighbors really didn't like it. There, there is a, a, a tower on most mosques in China and the call to prayer was given from the tower. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's a recording, but uh, back, back in the old days, yes, there was a tower. There was also, um, I don't have a picture of it here, but um, the place from which this pic the, the upper left-hand picture is taken is the tower from which, it's called in Chinese the Wang Yue Lou, the tower from which one watches for the moon, so that the, the Ahong would calculate the calendrical changes from that tower. Uh, so there was, yes, in, in both cases there was a tradition of towers for the call to prayer and for the moon watching, but the call to prayer in this particular site had been given up. So was that differentiated in the mosque uh, because of the minaret, for example, on the normal campus? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we can find examples of that. One of the very old mosques in China, it's usually claimed as Tang, but in fact it's probably Yuan, is the uh, Huaisheng Mosque in Guangzhou, which has a very tall tower from which the Azan would be offered. This rural mosque doesn't have one. It's at the center of a village. And uh, this, the, the call to prayer would have been given from this central tower here. Where this one? This one is in Tongxin north of Lanzhou city in Gansu. And I, I, I brought this picture here because it's a particularly beautiful tasmiya done in the wall. Uh, and this is a rural mosque, not a fancy urban one. But the decorative arts continued to be one way of defining our temples as different from their temples, especially the use of Arabic calligraphy, which as you know is a distinguishing feature of Muslim architecture all over the world. So architecture is one way that we can simultaneously belong and not belong. We can be part of this culture. Look at the roofs. Look at the way that the, that the buildings are built. They're octagonal or they're hexagonal. They have pointy roofs at the edges. They have all kinds of fanciful devices up on the roof tiles. But it's oriented west to east. And there are no statues. So that's what the Xi'an folk decided this is the most important. And indeed, this is a very common pattern in Ming Dynasty mosques. And that's one, and it is one that continues into the, into the 19th century. Yes. Oh, yes. There was always a wash house. Chi in Chinese courtyards, uh, this would be the center axis right here. Uh, let me see if I, yeah, right, right through here would be the center axis. We're standing in the Wang Yue Lo, the building for watching the moon, and you would proceed straight through this, um, this corridor into the main prayer hall here. To the sides would be buildings which would contain the mosque officials' offices, the schoolrooms, the washroom for ablutions, and perhaps a, uh, a, a dining room for communal gatherings at times of celebration, for the giving of charity, and so on. So Chinese courtyard architecture worked perfectly well for Islamic purposes in this case. And in, 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 in Ming architecture generally, it was, it, was, it, was, it was perfectly possible to have all the necessary features of a mosque within the Chinese architectural tradition. Now I'm going to talk a moment about Fujian, which I mentioned before. Fujian, of course, is the southeast coast, the area to which the ships came, and from which uh, Muslim trade to the Middle East uh, regularly went until the middle of the 15th century, after which it stopped. There was still trade with Java, which was in the process of Islamicization, but it was not Islamic trade. And the, the Muslim communities of this part of the world were cut off from, not entirely from the Ummah, but from uh, constant contact from the middle of the 15th century on. And within a century, they had started to decline as Muslim communities. And within two centuries, they were no longer identifiably Muslims. That's how long it took. In this overwhelmingly non-Muslim world of Fujian, it took about two centuries 
for most vestiges of Islamic practice to disappear. The mosque, as you see, fell into ruins, and the Muslims ceased, in effect, being practicing Muslims and became what we might call descendants of Muslims. They kept genealogies in the Confucian manner. Uh, their dietary habits changed. And you must remember, and it's always something we have to remind ourselves of in the Chinese culture area, that in, in Chinese the word zhou, which means meat, means pork. Meat is pork. It, under such conditions, of course, it's very difficult to maintain a halal tradition if you don't have intercommunity communications, places where people will raise livestock, people who are ritual slaughterers, and so on. Those folks simply were no longer there. And the communities drifted. And it was a very gradual drifting away from Islamic practice. Yes? Yes. Um, Arabic names were still yes. the main place names and uh, British names. Mm -hmm. But if you, you mentioned names before. Already. Right. So these, these folks were using entirely Chinese names by the end of the Ming Dynasty, by, that is by the 17th century. Uh, and indeed, one of the most fascinating fields of study at this point is of these descendants of Muslims or ex-Muslims to find out what vestiges of Muslim practice remain, rather like studying the, the, uh, the conversos in Spain, the, the ex-Jews, what Jewish elements remain in their obviously Roman Catholic households. Uh, in this case, Barbara Pillsbury has done a wonderful dissertation back in the 70s, which unfortunately was never published as a book, so I just have to tell you about it. Um, Barbara worked in a, in a descendants of Muslims community in Taiwan. And what she found there was families called Guo. This is a, a town in which half the families are, are surnamed Guo. And the, Guo, the Guos are everywhere. Every, every gate is a Guo gate. But there were certain Guos who behaved very slightly differently from their neighbors. At Chinese New Year time, as some of you are probably aware, the family offers food to its ancestors. Now, some people call this ancestor worship, but that's not exactly what it is. You're actually feeding them. It's ancestor feeding. Ancestor communication, if you will. You are loving your ancestors by feeding them, which is a very Chinese way to love somebody. It's love, and it's communication. You're talking with them, and you do this by presenting them food and ritual. In most Guo households, this food was largely pork, with all the side dishes, of course. But in certain Guo households, they offered only beef to the ancestors. Why? Because they were the descendants of Muslims. They themselves ate pork. But they would never dare to give pork to their ancestors because their ancestors had gone to so much trouble not to eat it. And they, they used fascinating language in Barbara's evocation. The, um, these these ex-Muslims or descendants of Muslims would say, we have dirtied our mouths. But our ancestors suffered so much not to do so, it would be a deep disrespect, an unfilial act to give them pork. And so we give them only beef. That's about as close to being a non-Muslim as you can get and still have some vestige of Islamic practice. And that was Barbara's thesis. She's an anthropologist and lived in this community and figured this out. Uh, so that's, that's, that happens a lot in southeastern China, in Fujian and in Taiwan. Yes? <laughs> yes or no? The idea of the Huizu, of course, dates from the 1950s. It's a brand new idea. Before that, the word Huizu was only used inside the Communist Party. And that began in the 1930s. These were people who would have, if they were Muslims, they would have called themselves Hui Jiao Tu. Islam would have been Hui Jiao. And 
They did not. Uh, they weren't Muslims in any meaningful sense of the word and hadn't been since the end of the Ming Dynasty, which was after all 300 years before. However, and there are great funny stories about this, funny with a tinge of sadness, uh, the Chinese state, having invented the Huizu, needed to decide who was inside it and who was not. So, if, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to hold that story for this afternoon. There is a wonderful story attached to it involving a delegation from Kuwait. But uh, I'll, I'll tell the story this afternoon, if I may. Lasher, you had a question. Uh, I'm not Lasher. Yes, you are. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I know some family men in the book. I don't know the other two sets of family men, how it comes out. But, I mean, does that reflect some sort of feeling that you would feel guilty about your, your conclusion? No. They are Guas. Indeed, there, there, are, there, are, there are Gua families. Oh, Gua, not Gua. Gua. Because you mean, you know, in Chinese, Gua. You know. No, 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 this is Gua. No, it's, it's Gua, okay. which is an ordinary surname. And it's, it's especially popular on the east coast of Fujian. There are guas everywhere in eastern Fujian. And indeed, one of the things that we've been able to do since foreign scholars and Taiwan scholars too can now go to Fujian and do research, we found guas in Fujian who are related to the guas in Taiwan and we can follow the differences in their self-appellations, in what they call themselves, in their relationship to their Islamic to their Muslim ancestors and so on, given the two different systems of identification in the two, uh, I dare not call them two countries, but in, in China and Taiwan. Uh, uh, I'd actually noticed that, but I'm not allowed to say it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the problem is who are the guas? Are they Hui Zuren? Are they Hui Jiao Tu? Are they ordinary Han whose ancestors believed in Islam? And we'll talk about that later. So let me get, that, let me get to that later. Yes. So you think from the two, from yes. Outside. Talk about it later. Kweizu is, a, is, a, is an ethnic group category created in the 20th century by the Chinese Communist Party after a series of debates that I'll talk about later about whether we are a sep, we Chinese speaking Muslims, are a separate ethnic group or whether we are just Chinese people who happen to be Muslims. And this became an extraordinarily virulent and complex dispute, not just between two political parties, but between intellectuals who thought about these things a lot and published their, their articles in magazines, because it's not inherently obvious that one answer is right and the other is wrong. So we'll talk about that later. Now, descendants of Muslims built this temple. This is a typical Guandi Miao. These people were in no sense of the word Muslims. But their ancestors were. And this is very typical of Fujian. The southeast coast, because the Ming cut it off from connections with the Ummah, fairly rapidly people who had been Muslims ceased being Muslims. Now, this is my summary of the problem. None of our people speak Arabic or Persian anymore. Many cannot read or write Arabic, but only Chinese. How do we transmit our faith in this context? Answer, we must continue to teach correct prayer in the mosque in the Jingtang Jiao Yu, the scripture hall education, but we must also explain Islam in Chinese the only language in which our people can speak or read. Second problem. If you want to do that, Chinese has no vocabulary of monotheism, no equivalence for the subtle, complex theology, logic, and ritual law of Islam as expressed in Arabic and Persian. The answer? We must develop subtle correlations between available Chinese words and Islamic concepts because of the answer to the first problem. We must explain Islam in Chinese. Finally, many non-Muslim Chinese consider our religion to be uncivilized, barbaric, that is, non-Chinese. 
The answer, we must demonstrate that Islam is a civilized Tao. You all know the word Tao. It means a way or a path. A moral and ethical equivalent to the Neo-Confucianism favored by the Chinese elite. How are we going to solve this problem? And there's the answer. The Han Kitab. Han, of course, means Chinese in this sense. It's not an ethnic group, but a culture. And you know the word Kitab. This is the Han Kitab. These are texts written in Chinese explaining Islam. The, the earliest one that we have dates from 1642, the last years of the Ming. There were probably slightly earlier ones, but they're no longer extant. Two of the most important ones have been translated into English by the great Islamicist uh, Murata Sachko, a Japanese scholar of Persian who also knows Chinese exceedingly well. And both of those books, if you are interested in what it means to be a Muslim in Chinese, these books will help you a lot, but you have to know a great deal about Islamic philosophy before you can read them. I have them both here. You can have a look at them if you'd like. Uh, Sachko is a truly remarkable scholar, married to another Persianist, William Chittick, and between the two of them, they have done more than any other married couple that I know of to make Islam in China available in English. Are they? Fabulous. They're the best. You're going to have a great time with them. Do not miss their lectures. They're extraordinary. Because, unlike me, I'm a social historian. I'm interested in what happens in society, in maps, in city walls, in mosque building and stuff like that. Bill and Sachko are interested in ideas. And they will bring to you the philosophical foundations of writing a Neo-Confucian Islamic text. Now, why does it have to be a Neo-Confucian Islamic text? Well, I would offer for your delectation the possibility of writing an accurate Islamic text in English. It's doable, but it's very hard. It's hard even though English has an already established vocabulary of monotheism, which Chinese does not. And we find this fascinating moment in the late Ming and early Qing periods, that is in the 15th to the 17th centuries, when Muslims, Jews, and Roman Catholics are all attempting to explain monotheism in Chinese. The Jews were indigenous. There was a tiny Jewish community in the city of Kaifeng, and they had, and we have from them texts in which they attempt to explain the basics of Judaism in Chinese. The Roman Catholics, of course, were foreigners, but among them were Jesuits of very high erudition who had learned not only to read but to write in classical Chinese and created texts such as the Tianzhu Shiyi in which they explained Roman Catholicism in classical Chinese. And the Muslims, who were also indigenous, did the same. So we have this fascinating moment of interchange. And we know, for example, that Matteo Ricci, the earliest of the Jesuits, went to Kaifeng to visit the synagogue. So he had been exposed to the, to the uh, inscriptional, the epigraphic vocabulary of the Chinese Jews. And we know that these writers of the Han Kitab read the Jesuit texts in classical Chinese. They called them Xi Shu, Western books. But they were written in Chinese. And so they could borrow vocabulary and ideas from those texts, as well as disputing against them, as they did. So we have this amazing conjunction of the three Abrahamic monotheisms attempting to explain themselves in Chinese at roughly the same time, and all of them having the devil of a time doing it. Chinese is not flexible in the matter of religious vocabulary. It is very difficult, as the Buddhists discovered very early on, it is not easy to create neologisms in Chinese that effectively convey foreign ideas.
the Buddhist texts, took about 500 years to be well translated. Between the 1st and the 7th centuries AD. And the best translations used a great deal of transliteration. So that the word bodhisattva, for example, meaning a person who could enter into the state of nirvana but refuses to do so in order to stay behind and save souls, a very great and wonderful sort of person, is called in Chinese pusa, which is a transliteration of bodhisattva. There's no Chinese word for that. No more is there a Chinese word for many of the crucial concepts of Islam, the most obviously being God. How do you translate Allah into Chinese? Well, some people tried transliterating it, Anla. The N, of course, taking the place of the doubled L. So instead of Allah, it's Anla. That's good, but it's obviously barbaric. This is not a Chinese word. We do not use non-Chinese words in Chinese texts. What are we going to do? Fortunately, scholars have looked at this with, some, with considerable care, and we have here by James Frankel a wonderful new book entitled Rectifying God's Name. The subtitle is Liu Zhi's Confucian Translation of Monotheism and Islamic law. This is a book about the translation process itself through a single Chinese work, the Tianfang Dianli, which I have a copy of here for those of you who can read Chinese. Uh, the Tianfang Dianli is one of the most important of the Han Kitab books. Uh, it was written by the same fellow who wrote the Tianfang Xingli, which is what Sachko and Bill are translating here. Um, this is a philosophical text. This is a ritual text. They're intimately related in the, minds of, in the mind of their author. So we are now beginning to understand this translation process in ways that are, that are scholarly and, uh, and historically useful. But it is a translation process, but it's, it's also a creation process because Islam and Neo-Confucianism are really quite distant. It was the job of these Khan Kitab thinkers to present Islam in a way that was not only in Chinese, but was entirely compatible with the orthodox ideology of Neo-Confucianism that their state, the Ming state and then the Qing state, had declared to be truth. These guys performed some pretty amazing gymnastics, truth be told, but they were wonderful adapters. How can one use such a different language to explain Islam? So the Khan Kitab con constitutes a really crucial innovation, but it's also an adaptation and a translation of Islamic truth into Neo-Confucian truth. And the saying from Liu Zhi, in the, it, which it's in the Tianfang Dianli, I'll find it for you if you like, the original. Although these principles are expressed in Islamic writings, they are actually no different from what is found in the Confucian canonical books. And he believed that to the soul. For him, the Confucian books held truth, the Islamic books held truth, and therefore they must be completely compatible. He also knew better. He knew they weren't. And so, like all these other monotheists trying to write in Chinese, he knew when he had to leave things out. Uh, my favorite of the leaving things out is in the Tian Zhu Shiri of Matteo Ricci, in which he is explaining Roman Catholicism in Chinese and leaves out the crucifixion. It's just not there. You'd think that would be pretty important for a Roman Catholic. But he couldn't put it in because it would be in instantly obvious to any Chinese person that a religion at the core of which was a criminal, 
was a very bad religion indeed. And so the crucifixion simply didn't happen. He left it out. Liu Zhi, Ma Zhu, Wang Daiyu, the writers of the Han Kitab, also had to leave some things out. Some of them put them in. They were very daring and, and they were feisty. They said, take that. For example, burying the dead without a coffin. What could be worse in Chinese culture than burying the dead without a coffin? That is the most disrespectful, the most unfilial thing you can do. Indeed, there are tremendous memoirs of guilt from people who lived through, say, the anti-Japanese war or other conflagrations in China who couldn't bury their parents properly, couldn't get a coffin. This is the most guilty feeling that somebody can have. It's terrible. People are eaten alive by this. Wang Daiyu takes it on. And I'll read you the passage. This is my translation. If I can find it. They say, this is Wang Daiyu, Orthodox Islamic law is far too sharp and harsh. In embalming and burial, this teaching does not allow the use of a coffin or an outer coffin. And that does not accord with human feelings. This is his imagined Chinese interlocutor. I reply, not using coffins attains to two high principles. One is nature and one is purity. By nature, I mean that the origin of humankind is earth. So going back to the root, returning to the origin, those are very good Confucian phrases, going back to the root, gui ben, returning to the origin, gui yuan, these are very good Confucian ideas. Going back to the root, returning to the origin, that means returning to the earth, and we call that nature. As for purity, when we bury human flesh and blood in the great earth, it can be transformed and become earth. How can this not be pure? The dead are without worldly knowledge, so even a gold inner coffin and a jade outer coffin cannot benefit them. Now, Wang Daiyu was one feisty dude. He was going after Chinese culture and saying, look, we're better than you are, sorry. And he's saying it in Chinese. His successors were a little more tactful. They either didn't mention it at all, or they came up with much more gentle distinctions. We do it this way, you do it that way, but it really doesn't matter. That's not the heart of the business. Wang Daiyu took them on. So these guys have different characters. They're not all unified. They're certainly not homogeneous. Each of them has a different way of writing. I'm currently doing a biography of the fellow who wrote the book in the center, the Qingzhen Zhenan, um, Yusuf Ma Zhu, one of the most fascinating Muslim intellectuals of the late 17th century. These Han Kitab writers had their own character, of course, but their purpose was uniform, and that is to demonstrate the compatibility of Islam with Chinese civilization. And by Chinese civilization, they meant Neo-Confucian orthodoxy. Here are two stories of creation. Remember, these are attempting to explain creation as Islam had transmitted it. Try these on for size. These are, of course, translated from Chinese, not from Arabic or Persian. Arabic or Persian, of course, has a language for creation. But the idea of a creator god is utterly absent from Chinese culture. There is no Zhao Hua Zhu. The earth simply came into being. And according to the orthodox Neo-Confucian texts, the earth comes into being from the Wuji, the beyond ultimate, which somehow, without any consciousness or plan, transforms, because it must, into the Taiji, which transforms into yin and yang, which transforms into the 10,000 things. There is no transformer. How do you place a transformer, a mover, a creator into that 
And this is two guys trying to do that. Yes, you have a question. They were Muslims. They were practicing Muslims, all of them. In fact, uh, Leo Jir's father was an Aho. Uh, Madru came from a distinguished family. He might even, well, he called himself a Sayyid. He called himself a descendant of the Prophet. No. These guys did not come from Fujian. Remember, what, my point about Fujian and the cutting off from the Ummah was that it happened in Fujian, not that it happened in China. It happened in Fujian. Madru came from Yunnan in the far southwest where the connections had continued through Burma and India. Liu Zhe came from Nanjing. Now that's really interesting. He came from the big eastern city. Where does he get his connection to the Ummah? And the answer is books. He has texts. And he's left us a list of 67 Arabic texts and Persian texts that he had in his library. So he, he had books as well as, of course, the Confucian books, which he'd studied from childhood. So Liu Zhi is connected to the Ummah through text, Ma Zhu through more direct communication plus text. I have one more connection. I'm, I'm way over time here. This is what happens when you invite a professor to talk. We just keep on talking. At the same time as the Khan Kitab authors are attempting to express Chinese, in Chinese Islamic religion, developments on the other side of China, particularly here in the Northwest, are changing the way the Northwest, the Muslims of the Northwest practice Islam. And this, of course, is the great spread of Sufism which happens all over the Muslim world. And in China, it arrives in the 15th and 16th centuries, originally as text, but by the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, as actual people. Sufis come to northwestern China. This is the tomb of Apak, Apak Khodra. Uh, it, it's very unlikely that he's actually buried there. And this has become a truly ghastly tourist site. Uh, if you go to Kashgar, you can go there if you like, because everybody does, but it ain't much. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely building, but it's become conflated with all kinds of nasty Chinese nationalism and stories that never happened and all kinds of nonsense. So beware of what you hear there. The building is beautiful. Apa Khoja was a Central Asian Sufi, and you must remember that the kind of Sufism that was practiced in Central Asia tended to be not, well, of course there were Kalandars, there were crazy Sufis, there were wild guys of all kinds, but there was also the strict Sharia observant form of Sufism that we might associate with Sirhindi. And that Sufism also traveled through Central Asia to China. And Apak Khodra was a Sufi of that kind. He was one of the very first Sufis to travel to China and make disciples there. He gathered followers, including the founders of a number of very important Chinese Sufi organizations. His most important student was probably Abul Futuh Malaitshe. Uh, see, there, there are the two names. He was a Haji. He went to Arabia but he also went to Yemen. And in Yemen, he met his teacher and stayed there and studied. And then returned to China after some years of study, bearing objects, of course, a prayer rug, a Quran, other texts, and ideas. The most obvious of which were Sufi ideas. The, pronoun the pronouncing of, of dhikr, of the remembrance of God rhythmic internal meditative practice, group meditative practice, the institution of the zawiya, of the, of the Sufi hospice, as a center for communal life, either with or outside the mosque. Yeah? Zabid. Uh, 
Uh, I, can, I can give you the references to articles in both Chinese and English for that. Uh, excuse me? I have no idea. I'm not a Yemeni scholar. I just know my teacher told me he went to Zabid, therefore he must have gone to Zabid. Uh, my teacher in this case was the great Joseph Fletcher, professor of Central Asian history at Harvard, who did the actual detective work in texts to discover that these Chinese pilgrims went to Yemen as well as to the holy cities. He actually went to Yemen and dug through Sufi hagiographies to find the names of the teachers that Malai Chi identified in his Chinese texts. That was detective work. Anyway, Malai Chi came back and founded a Sufi order where they practiced the conventional Naqshbandi silent dhikr, but also vocal dhikr, which they had probably from the Shadiliya, but we don't know. In any case, this is his tomb. This is what is called in Chinese a gungbei, Persian gunbad, Arabic, of course, qubba. This is a gungbei, a tomb. It doesn't exactly have a dome, but it's close enough. And nothing could be more obviously simultaneously Chinese and Islamic than this. No Chinese temple, conventional temple, would ever have a building that looked like that. But no mosque outside of China would ever have a building that looked like that either. This is northwestern China in brick and stone. Malai Chir's founding of the Khafi, he calls his, his suborder the Khafiya, in Chinese the Huasi Menhuan. And the Huasi was a, uh, an innovation in the Muslim society of northwestern China. The main reason for that lay in the centrality of the sheikh. As in Sufi orders all over the world, the sheikh held a particular charisma. We could call it a, a religious charisma. There's no, there's no English word for baraka, but we can call it religious charisma. And his religious charisma spread over a number of communities, which was not the case with ordinary non-Sufi mosques. In each non-Sufi mosque, the elders of the community would invite an Ahung to come and teach, and the Ahung would live there and be paid a salary and would either be renewed for more terms or would be let go and another Imam hired. In a Sufi community, the Sheikh is the center. And it could be a number of villages, a number of towns, even a number of cities, communities would be loyal to a particular Sheikh. This is new and was perceived as innovative. So some Muslims brought lawsuits against Malai Chi for doing this. And this is something that strikes Muslims from outside of China as very odd. To bring a lawsuit regarding Islamic practice or community matters in a non-Muslim court is a very strange thing to do. But by this point, the Qing, the dynasty ruling China at the time, about which I'll talk a little more later, was completely legitimate in the eyes of these Muslims. It was our dynasty. And so to take such matters to the secular court was pretty much the only avenue of redress they had because a Qadi trusted by one side would not be trusted by the other. And so they took it to the secular courts. And this begins a pattern in the early 18th century that continues, of course, to the present day of taking Islamic matters to a non-Muslim court. And finally, there returns another pilgrim, also from Yemen, also a Naqshbandi, Ma Mingxin, Aziz, who has been initiated into a somewhat different version of Sufism. He and Malachar had probably been colleagues in the Middle East. They knew each other well. But the orders they founded over the course of their lifetimes, this is the middle of the 18th century, came into conflict. This is exceedingly unusual uh, because those conflicts didn't just stay in the classroom or the debate room where they might have done. They became violent. And violent conflict between Muslim groups marks the history of Northwest China from this point, from the 1740s, all the way through the 19th century. 
between the late, between the late 1600s and the mid 1700s were the foundings of most of these orders. Uh, these aren't the only ones. These two Naqshbandi suborders, which called themselves Khafiya and Jahriya, were two. There was also a Qadiriya, Shadiliya, and a number of other orders came to Gansu at that time. Yes. Well, actually, within 25 years of the return of these two pilgrims, while these two guys were still alive. And it had to do, according to official documents, and if you read the Chinese documents, it's very clear, it's about whether you read or recite your prayers aloud or silently. This is why the Sufis are fighting. Of course, the Chinese courts didn't know what Sufis were. They had no idea what they were looking at. And so they had no choice but to believe what the Muslims told them. And the Muslims, of course, had every interest in deceiving the Chinese courts in order to get the decision. What was actually going on, we really don't. No. We can guess. Because some of the lawsuits were over the building of mosques. Some of the lawsuits were over the loss of members of a community from one suborder to another. Some were involved with the giving of gifts to the sheikh. So what we can see that there were at least some underlying economic, demographic, even political motives involved in these lawsuits. But they are always couched in terms of religious minutiae, like whether you read the dhikr, whether you recite dhikr aloud or silently. And if I had another three hours, I would tell you the story of a paper I'm currently writing about a particular text which was held inside the khafiyya, inside the silent ones. Khafi means those who recite their dhikr silently which was a manual for reciting the vocal dhikr. It's very unlikely that the khafiya didn't use the vocal dhikr. In other words, that the khafis were jahris. It's also probable that the jahris were khafis. So that the religious justification of whether you recite it aloud or silently really had nothing to do with it. But it made a great case in a Qing court because those people will believe anything. And the reason they'll believe anything is that they really don't understand Islam. Why should they? So the Qing courts are persuaded to side with one or the other by these religious justifications, which were only the most superficial causes of conflict. Now this is a fascinating photograph because it'll show you the new and old headquarters of Ma Lai Chi's Mun Huan. I just, I just wanted to throw this in here because the architecture is so cool. The old headquarters obviously on the right, the new one on the left. Now isn't that an extraordinary building? It's sort of, I don't know, shopping mall via Anglo-Indian something or other. <laughs> I think it's horrible. <laughs> I love the old one. But this is, the left one, is the style of architecture which is now favored in many Sino-Muslim communities because it is, and I quote, Arabic. This is the new thing in China since the 1980s, is to build mosques that look like that. Yeah? This is a photograph. They're literally the headquarters of the same organization, the old one and the new one. This organization continues. It is very widespread. It is very powerful. The history of these Sufi orders is not an ancient history. It's a continuing history. Go ahead. What? Sorry. This? Linxia. Gansu Linxia. Lao Hezhou. It's in southern Gansu. It's in southern Gansu. Yes, sorry. You had, another, you had a question. This is local money. Oh, I know it. I've talked to the folks. Some oil money, some outside money is present in China. And each of these brand new buildings, may, there may be contributions from foreigners, but these are communities which have made a great deal of money since the opening in the, in the late 1970s of, China, of the Chinese economy to the world economy. And uh, I know, for example, 
ordinary farmers living outside these communities who have become innovators in their fields who would, would donate annually 50,000 yuan to the mosque. And that's one family. Now, 50,000 yuan is an awful lot of money in the 1980s. And that would be their annual donation to the mosque. Yeah? It, it is now. And I'll talk about that when we get to the late 19th century. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. But when these, when these disputes broke out between these rival Sufi orders, no Qadi could be found who would be trusted by both sides. That is to say, the conflict grew so deep precisely because they felt their, what should we say, their interests to be completely incompatible. Early on, and we have no direct case law on this, it's likely that some of the conflicts would have been referred to Sharia judges to the far west, in Kashgar, for example, or even in Bukhara. But the distances are immense, and it would have required tremendous fortitude to take a case to so distant a judge. The local judges simply couldn't handle it, and so, as I said, the combatants, and they turned out to be literally physical combatants, took their cases to the secular court. Okay, people are going to start twitching here. It's noon. I'm supposed to be finishing lecture three. I'm finishing lecture two. This is not good. Uh, I'm not qu quite sure what to do, but let me finish. As I said, this is a continuing tradition. These are Jahri Muslims at prayer. Uh, this is the Khafiya headquarters. These, these suborders, these Naqshbandi suborders, continue to exist. And uh, so these issues are going to continue through the rest of the day. Conclusions. From the mid-Ming mid to the early Qing, that is, from the, the 15th to the 17th or early 18th century, Muslims in China acculturated in language, dress, and other aspects of everyday life. Some of them worried that this would lead to assimilation and loss of religious faith and life. In different parts of China, groups of Muslims dealt with this problem differently. In Fujian, in southeast China, assimilation reached the point that some descendants of Muslims gradually ceased to practice their religion. In the cities of eastern China, Muslims literate in Chinese and Arabic wrote the Han Kitab to explain Islam to Muslims who could read only Chinese. Incidentally, they also wrote to explain it to non-Muslims, to demonstrate that Islam was civilized. In northwest China, some Muslims began to write Chinese, the only language they could speak, with the Arabic script, the only language they could read. Also in northwest China, the arrival of Sufi Turuk brought about a revival of religious faith, but also created rivalries between Sufi groups, which sometimes escalated into violence. Therefore, we must conclude that few generalizations about Muslims in China can be historically true. We must look at specific places and times to understand what happened in many different contexts. And we'll continue with that thought in the third lecture. Thank you. Uh, yes, things are going to get pretty ghastly here for a bit. Uh, indeed, from the 18th century until about, oh, 1980. It's not going to be a whole lot of fun. It's fascinating. It's riveting stuff. But this is the, this is the two centuries, beginning around 1800 when the Chinese culture area loses its status as the preeminent economic power in Eurasia and becomes the China with which the 19th and early 20th century Brits were so familiar, a China that was degraded, that was a loser. Uh, over the past thousand years, that, that status has really only endured from about 1800 into the late 20th century. Uh, this is what's called in Chinese a period of humiliation. And things are pretty violent internally. The Chinese saying is uh, internal chaos, external catastrophe. Nei luan wai huan. And that
pretty well describes it, I'm sorry to say. And so uh, you'll forgive me if things are not going to be entirely pleasant for the next hour or two, but I'll do my best to move through it quickly so we can get to the good stuff at the end. I skipped over this in the previous lecture, though quite a bit of that last bit about Sufis and the Khan Kitab does in fact take place during the Qing period, but I skipped the Qing conquest in order to do it here. The Qing are a Manchu dynasty declared in, 18, in 1636, the foundation of the great Qing, uh, direct rivalry with the great Ming to its south, uh, and not a nomadic people. The, uh, people do call the Manchus nomads, they were not. They were a pastoral, agricultural people, lived in settled communities, villages and towns, but they were northerners and the growing season is rather short up there, so they kept large numbers of animals, and they partook of the Central and North Asian tradition of cavalry warfare. Uh, they were exceedingly skilled horsemen, uh, and I, I use horsemen in the old sense because the women were as well. Uh, they were horse folk, and their relationship with their horses and their other animals was an intimate one. They lived together, they were fine stock breeders, and there was plenty of space in their part of the world in what would be otherwise be called Manchuria. That's a name that's out of fashion these days, but we can use it. Uh, there was plenty of space in Manchuria to graze fine horses. They also partook of Chinese culture to the extent that they had lots of communication with the Ming, including a number of Chinese literate folk who worked for the earliest Qing rulers and who helped them to build a governmental structure that worked. This was a structure based on war. The Qing organized their people into what were called banners, flags in Chinese, qi, uh, and these banners were the banners of war. And each of the banners was commanded by a high prince with, with subordinate commanders organized in a typical military hierarchy. But it did not just, it wasn't just the soldiers, it was the soldiers and their families. They belonged to the banner, and the banner organization went far beyond military to all kinds of civilian functions, including the distribution of food. So that the banner, the, the oddest but I think most useful comparison to the banner for those of you who know contemporary China is the Danwei, the work unit which provides you with housing, food or food coupons, income, gives you approval to marry or not to marry, to have children or not to have children, takes care of you in your old age and so on. It's kind of a, an all-encompassing work unit. The banners were like that. And the Qing organized themselves into banners. The dynasty was proclaimed by this fellow to the left, uh, Hong Taiji. And Hong Taiji was primus inter, inter pares. He was one of many Manchu war leaders. But by virtue of his literacy, he was the only literate one among his many brothers, uh, by virtue of his literacy and his skill, he managed to make himself what had not been the case before, a supreme ruler of the Manchus. And in 1636, he declared the great Qing very obviously in direct confrontation with the great Ming. And over the next eight years, built up their military strength and began to expand their kingdom. The expansion is dramatic. You'll remember at the beginning I said that modern China really is the Qing. Well, this is how it happened. Now, you probably can't see the dates very well. This is the original Manchu homeland here. They expand southward, take the city of Shenyang here, rename it Mukden in Manchu, make it their capital. They build a bureaucracy there consisting of Manchus, Mongols, and Chinese, local folks who flock to their banners, who wouldn't. And in 1644, they cross the barrier of the Great Wall here at Shanghai Guan, take the city of Beijing, and begin a conquest of the rest of East and part of Central Asia that lasts 120 years. It's a very long conquest and rather slow. But the Chinese culture area is subdued rapidly here 
more slowly to the west and particularly to the southwest. And finally, Taiwan, which had not been part of the Ming Empire, but had been part of both the Spanish and the Dutch empires at one point or another, and of independent kingdoms uh, ruled by Chinese. Actually, not quite by Chinese. That's not really fair. The, the leadership of, the, of that island was in the hands of a Sino-Japanese family, the Zhengs, uh, who the men were usually Chinese, the women usually Japanese. And uh, they made a fascinating world there in Taiwan. But they took Taiwan in 1683. So the conquest of the Chinese culture area was complete in 40 years. War devastation throughout. Then, beginning in the 1690s, Mongolia, it says outer Mongolia there, but that's really quite anachronistic. In fact, it was right about here to, in 1697. Then even more campaigning, losing, retreating, campaigning again. So that in 1757 and 1759, this area here, again, this is hyperbole. They never made it to Lake Balkhash. No, 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 they did not. It was here. But that's still quite a substantial hunk of turf. Um, not at all Chinese in any way, but was incorporated into the Qing. And then, of course, comes the big problem with the Qing. Was Tibet part of the Qing or was it not? This is, of course, a question with tremendous resonance now, not relevant directly to our problem of Islam. Though, interestingly, there, there are three mosques in Lhasa, uh, and there are Muslims there. But it's not directly part of our problem, so I think in order to dodge controversy, I'll just duck it. Uh, but the question remains, was Tibet or was it not part of the, the Qing Empire? And I'm afraid that the evidence to, to date can produce only an answer of maybe. Because definitions of sovereignty and the nature of sovereignty in, in modern states are so radically different from the way kingdoms and states worked back then that we really can't say Tibet was or was not part of the Qing Empire. So I'll stop there. Anyway, the conquest of the northwestern green stuff out there incorporated for the first time territory into a China-based state that was substantially or even entirely Muslim. And that made a big difference in how the Qing state handled Islam and Muslims. So my, my argument in this lecture is going to be mostly about changing perceptions inside the context of an expanding Qing empire, which creates one of the largest land-based states that's ever been, certainly one of the largest that had ever been to date. The Russian Empire, of course, hadn't yet expanded into Central Asia or even into Eastern Siberia at this point. So that this was an enormous multicultural empire within which Muslims formed a component. They were an absolute majority out in what came to be called Xinjiang, the new frontier. But remember all the little black triangles? They were all over the place in the Chinese culture area where they formed a significant minority of the population. By, by the mid-Qing, Muslims in northwest China often took Islamic cases to the Qing law courts. This is, of course, a Reproduction. This isn't a real Qing law court. This is a bunch of actors playing a Qing law court. But just to give you an idea that Muslims would present themselves and kneel and knock their heads on the floor in front of the magistrate and present law cases. The gent on the right who's bowing is presenting a legal document, a litigation document to the magistrate. The fellow on the right with the board around his neck is, of course, being punished by that same magistrate. By taking Islamic cases to the Qing courts, the Muslims were testifying, in a way, that the state was legitimate. And so, in a sense, they were claiming 
to belong there. They were part of the Qing Empire. They were no longer ke. They were not sojourners. They were part of the scene. They belonged. And that claim is one that has, as, as you've seen so far, has taken hundreds of years to generate. Are we strangers or are we not? Do we belong here or do we not? And from the other side, from the non-Muslim side, who are these people? What are they doing here? Are they civilized? Are they barbarians? Yeah? Um, in the last section when you mentioned uh, um, the northwest of China, yes. um, do you mean in the purple areas? In that okay. I, I, I realize that I haven't been very clear on geography. Let me, let me go back and we'll have a little geography lesson with this map. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Is that all right? Okay. Remember I was talking about Fujian, where the, where the Muslims really did lose Islam. That's here. Taiwan was part of Fujian under the Qing Dynasty administration. So this is Fujian. When I talk about Northwest China, I mean this. Remember that though the country China goes way out there, the Chinese culture area is here. And so when Chinese folks talk about the Xibei, about the Northwest, this is what they mean. They don't mean that. They mean this. The Southwest, Yunnan, is here. Obviously connected to the Islamic world very differently through Burma to India. Whereas here in Gansu, one would be connected via Turkestan to Bukhara, which was a great center of Sufi learning, and then further on to, the, to Persia. Here, folks are not directly connected to the Muslim world at all. There are lots of Muslims, some of them, as in Fujian and in other places, losing their faith generation by generation, others maintaining it, but obviously not by direct contact. How did they do it? Well, that's why we have these Han Kitab texts. They maintained Islam through texts, through books. And that's not surprising because that's the part of China where you find the highest rates of literacy. This is where people are the most likely to read books. And so with high literacy rates in Chinese, it would not be surprising if Muslims would have high literacy rates in Chinese and Arabic and Persian. Now, this is just a footnote for those of you who are more Sinologists than Islamicists or Muslims. How many Chinese in pre-modern times could read and write more than one language? Chinese was the only language you needed to know to be civilized. Under the Qing, of course, many Chinese learned to read and write Manchu. But that was the only other language that folks would have known. To know a language outside of East Asia made these Muslims a rather odd, fascinating, and of course, potentially subversive element within Chinese society. And by this point, as I've argued, they clearly did belong inside Chinese society. So is that an answer? Have I done enough geography? All right, let's go on. OK, I mentioned that Sufi Turuk, Sufi suborders or orders, come into conflict with one another in Gansu. That is to say, out here, beginning in the 18th century. And this escalates into violence in the mid to late 18th century. And I could tell you endless stories about it, but let me just summarize by saying that in 1781, a conflict between the Khafiya and the Jahriya those who putatively pronounce dhikr silently and those who putatively pronounce it aloud, though both probably did the other as well, escalates into actual street brawling. Now, why does this happen in Gansu and not in other parts of the Muslim world, where people who perform the two kinds of dhikr very often live side by side? In fact, many people perform both. But in Gansu, because it's at the very fringe of the Islamic world, because communication with the Muslim heartlands is difficult, texts from there and ideas from there brought back usually by pilgrims, returning pilgrims, bear tremendous weight and are not to be altered lightly. 
so that if two pilgrims come back bearing even slightly different messages, those two messages might well become conflicting orthodoxies within their communities. Does that make sense? It's a frontier problem, really, that frontiers are often conflictual precisely because there's no authority to judge among contending ideas, institutions, or leaders. The state isn't very effective out there, and certainly the Islamic world is effective only at a very great distance. So, a group of Jahri Sufis have heard that the state is going to come down on them, that the Jahriya has been condemned. It's only partially true. But the Jahriya is labeled by the state as being the divisive element here. And the reason is they arrived later. This is a, a profoundly conservative legal and administrative regime in the Qing. And so that which is older is by definition better. And the Khafiya gets labeled Lao Jiao, old teaching. The Jahriya is labeled Xin Jiao, new teaching. And so the new teaching is obviously guilty if there's conflict. So the officials come down from the provincial capital, including soldiers, to solve the problem of violence between the new teaching and the old teaching by essentially eradicating the new teaching. At least that's what the rumor says. And remember the power of rumor in pre-media societies. Rumor is news because there are no other news media. How do, you, how do you learn the news? You hear what's being said in the marketplace. And in the marketplace, people are saying, the soldiers are coming to exterminate the new teaching. So the new teaching guys go out to meet the soldiers, which seems a little foolhardy, but they disguise themselves as old teaching. And they meet the soldiers, and the soldiers, who are feeling pretty boastful and macho, say, we are here to exterminate the new teaching. That is, we're on your side. Not knowing, of course, that they're talking to the new teaching guys who whip out their swords and kill them. Now, this would be a kind of funny, deadly frontier misunderstanding if it weren't for the fact that by killing a government official under Qing law, one becomes a rebel. The killing of an official is an act not of criminality, but of rebellion. And so the new teaching, that is the Jahriya, is labeled as a rebel organization and thus worthy of complete extirpation. For the first few months, the Jahri Sufis are successful. They take a prefectural town, they kill some more officials, they kill a whole bunch of their rivals, Khafi Sufis. But then the governor in Lanjo captures their sheikh and imprisons him in the provincial capital. What are these Sufis to do? They're armed. They're well organized. There are only a few thousand of them. But their sheikh is in prison in the, prof in the provincial capital, a giant walled city, Lanjo. They march to Lanjo and demonstrate outside the walls. And the officials inside the city, who are terrified, bring their leader, Ma Mingxin, up onto the wall to demonstrate that he is indeed their prisoner, that they have power over him. And instead of being awed and returning to their homes as they've been ordered, the Sufis outside the city say their prayers and demand the return of their sheikh. The officials, seeing how stubbornly barbaric they actually are, take Ma Mingxin back into the city and behead him. This, of course, makes the Sufis into not just rebels, but religious warriors. They, uh, they take a mountaintop near the provincial capital and build fortresses on the mountaintop. Government forces led by this fellow, Agwe, are sent from as far away as Beijing but most of them are local forces, and they are ordered to exterminate the rebellious Muslims, and they proceed to do so. They kill them all. 
And this is the first occasion under the Qing when the dynasty has had reason not simply to condemn one side or another in a, in a Muslim lawsuit, but to find a Muslim group to be inherently opposed to social order and therefore worthy of extermination. Yes? They killed 3,000 people when they took the mountaintop, give or take. We don't actually know the exact number. Now, what's one of the least pleasant but most common human motivations for violence is revenge. We all do it. We all think about it. Criminal justice systems are in part systems of revenge. We all know that. We don't like to talk about it, though. In this case, revenge was openly sought by the surviving Jahri Sufis. Their sheikh had been killed. Their comrades had been killed. And they organized themselves in the eastern part of the province, not where the others had come from. And in 1784, three years later, they started killing officials and they started killing non-Muslims in revenge. They too were exterminated by the state. 1781-1784, the first Islamic rebellions against the Qing state. The obvious result of this kind of behavior is stereotyping Muslims as violent people. Muslims are, by this argument, inherently violent. And these two, uh, these two accusations against the Muslims are very typical of things one finds throughout the Qing record after about the middle of the 18th century. The Muslims are violent and overbearing, knavish and obstinate, doing evil whenever they please. They trade in contraband and huddle together to gamble. Gambling, of course, is illegal. They secretly stockpile weapons. In other words, they're born subversives. They stick together and rely on solidarity and strength of numbers to insult the Khan. Truculent and ruffianly, they go openly to rob and steal. Now, if you haven't heard words like that said about cultural and racial minorities, you haven't been listening. This is the sort of thing that gets said about minorities all the time, everywhere. That's what they're like. They stick together. They're scary. The forces of law and order cannot penetrate their communities, uh, which of course makes them ideal for fencing stolen goods. Because if goods taken from good people disappear into these subversive communities, they're gone. We can never find them again because we can't penetrate inside these closed communities. And this is a very common trope in understandings of people who are strangers, people who are different. Uh, it doesn't mean they're actually like that. It means that's the perception. Some of them were like that, but then lots of other people were like that too and didn't get stereotyped. And that's a fascinating dilemma. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Remember that the trouble between the Sufi orders had been on for some decades before the rebellions occurred. But in addition, and this is what I'm going to get to, Muslims in parts of China that were not strongly Muslim, out on the North China Plain, for example, where all those black triangles were, small Muslim communities, or even large ones, existed in a sea, an overwhelming sea of non-Muslims. And in those communities, we especially find these accusations of Muslims as natural-born thieves. There are various categories in Qing law under which Muslims were often charged. Armed larceny was a very common one. Gathering together in gangs to steal bearing weapons. Uh, cat burglary. Livestock rustling in areas where people kept flocks. Uh, especially of, of sheep and cattle because Muslims were, of course, associated with the trade in sheep and cattle because they're, ha they're, they're, they're halal. Uh, and meat dealing was one of the things that Muslims very often did because they had to. Now, 
Was there any reality to this? Of course there was. But the stereotypes grow not in the absence of information, but in the presence of rumor. If some Muslims go out to steal in gangs, all Muslims must be thieves. Just as, you know, if in the States we racialize this all the time. You know, black guys form gangs, they're very, very dangerous. White guys form gangs, that's what they're protecting the neighborhood. Radical different, radically different perceptions of them and us. And the majority us in many parts of China held the Muslims to be violent folk. So here we have the Qing Empire, a gigantic multicultural state, having incorporated a very large population and area of Turkic Muslim speakers, uh, Muslim Turkic speakers, excuse me. Incidentally, just, just to give you some sense of size, Xinjiang, this, is three times the size of France. It's enormous, and it's been incorporated into the empire. How are we going to govern it? What are we going to do about those people out there? The Qing is faced with this, but it's also faced closer to home, closer to the center, with this problem of Muslim rebellion, and even closer to the center in the North China Plain, with the problem of Muslims as violent people. This comes to a head in the mid-19th century. Now, this is a time, for those of you who know Chinese history, you'll know that this is a time of unprecedented violence in the Qing Empire. It's a time when the, when the empire itself is weakened by wars with foreign powers, England, France. But it's also weakened internally by corruption, maladministration, and an inability to collect sufficient revenues tax fraud. And so the middle of the 19th century is a time of truly unprecedented discontent which bursts into violence. You can't say enough large numbers to deal with what happened in the Qing Empire in the mid-19th century. Between 1850 and 1878, five major rebellious er areas detached 15 of the 18 provinces from the empire and somewhere in the vicinity of 30 million people died. Those are numbers so huge as to be unimaginable. Now the population of the Qing Empire at that point was probably 450 million. So 30 million people is not a huge percentage of the population, but can you imagine a catastrophe in which six or eight percent of the population dies? That's pretty awful. And if the population is 450 million, that's an enormous number of people. And three of those five large rebellions were conducted by Muslims. The first was in Yunnan, in the far southwest. Remember the part that's connected to Burma. There, there had been a gradual heightening of tension between Muslim and non-Muslim people for about a century due to the in-migration of large numbers of non-Muslims into an area where there was a substantial indigenous Muslim population. And so economic rivalry was a major motivation to violence there, especially in the mining industry. Miners, of course, have a reputation for being pretty violent fellas in part because miners live in large communities almost entirely male. These, these miners very often didn't have their families with them. And large populations of young males have a strong tendency to be unstable. So that's what we find in Yunnan. We find large numbers of young physical laborers, males, who in the 1840s, many of them lose their work. Many of the mines begin to play out. And at the same time, other influences, both Islamic and non-Islamic, come into the area. The most powerful are non-Islamic. Large numbers of Chinese poor looking for work, 
come down from central China into Yunnan at precisely this time as the local guys are losing their work. Violence is predictable and it breaks out in a couple of places in a shocking way. Whole Muslim communities are massacred. The most famous of these is Baoshan and the Baoshan Muslim community is literally eliminated. Thousands of people are killed in a kind of local bloodletting. Du Wenxiu is a well-educated man from Baoshan, a Muslim. When this happened, he went to Beijing, which is a very long walk. If you'll remember the map, Baoshan is here. Beijing is here. He walked to Beijing to present a law case to the court, which ignored him completely. So he went back to Yunnan, and instead of pursuing a career as an intellectual, as a, as a, uh, a community leader, he became a peddler and went from town to town, making friends and gathering what he thought would be a necessary defensive militia to prevent this from happening again. It happened again. And Du Wenxiu decided that the Qing was no longer a state under which the Yunnan Muslims could live. And he became an official rebel by literally founding a state. Based in western Yunnan, in the town of Dali, he founded Pingnan Guo, the state which pacifies the south. That's his headquarters there on the left. That's where his military was, state was, was headquartered. That's where his office was. And this is his official seal, which as you see is in Chinese and Arabic. His title in Chinese was the Grand Marshal, in Arabic, Sultan Suleiman. And he ran this state with a fascinating mixed bag of officials, some of them Muslim, some of them Han, some of them Manchus even. It was a Muslim state in the sense that many aspects of Sharia law were enforced. But it was also a state of mixed ethnicity. Officials didn't have to be Muslims. It was a fascinating melange of Ming, Qing, and Islamic laws, institutions, even dress. Uh, Sultan Suleiman sent an ambassador to Queen Victoria to try and get her to support Ping Nan Guo. Never made it, but it was a good idea, especially given Yunnan's proximity to India. And this state succeeded in holding off the Qing armies, even in expanding at times, but in the end, the Qing managed to assemble overwhelming military force, including some Muslims. And Ping Nan Guo was defeated, and the population of Dali was slaughtered uh, in a particularly barbaric fashion. It was a horrible, horrible conquest or reconquest by the Qing. In the northwest, in the provinces of Shanxi and Gansu, let me go back to the map. Shanxi is here. Gansu is here. In the provinces of Shanxi and Gansu, for a variety of reasons, highly differential from place to place, Muslims took on the armed might of the Qing state. And one by one, these rebellions were defeated. In some places, massacres were the result. In others, fascinatingly, Muslim commanders surrendered and signed on to the Qing military and then went on to defeat other Muslims at the next town. The reason I tell you that story is that those Muslims who signed on to the Qing military became the heart of a group of, of Muslim leaders that lasted into the middle of the 20th century. The Muslim warlords under the Republic which I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, 
are the direct descendants, often the sons and grandsons, of the military commanders who surrendered to the Qing and became members of the Qing military. Ma Hualong was the leader of one of these uh, rebellions, and this is his tomb. Even in the far northwest, in Xinjiang, in the new frontier of the new dominion, rebellion separated the entire area from the Qing. It was led not by an indigenous leader, but by a fellow who came across the mountains, across the Pamir, from the Fergana Valley. His name was Yakub Beg, and he set up an estate in Xinjiang that lasted almost two decades. He too, in the end, was defeated. This is Yakub Beg on the left. It's actually, it's actually a photograph uh, of the great Yakub. And this is the city that lay at the heart of his state. This is Kashgar. Kashgar uh, is one of the ancient oases of the Taklamahan. It's at the western end of the Taklamahan. The Qing included this area in a China-based state for the first time. And just to give you some sense of the geography, Kashgar is 800 miles closer to Baghdad than it is to Beijing. Kashgar is really in Central Asia. And the Qing conquest of that part of the world radically changed the geography and the political configurations of Central Asia. Kashgar, I, I show you this picture in part for nostalgia. I loved the city of Kashgar. I lived there and became very, very fond of the place. And it no longer exists. This entire old city, which was the city center, in the 1980s is gone. It's been bulldozed. It's all high rises now. The whole old city of Kashgar is gone. So that was quicker than the previous ones. I'm going to stop there with Kashgar. Mid 19th century, as awful as it gets, Muslims become a target of state violence in the southwest, in the northwest, in Xinjiang. They become the targets of special laws designed to restrain their violent character to the effect that if a Muslim and a Han committed the same crime, the Muslim would be punished more severely for it because he was a Muslim. Statutes like that were written into the code beginning in the, in the 18th century and increasingly in the 19th. In other words, as China, the culture area, as Qing, the empire, decline, so the status of the Muslims within it declines. I'm not claiming any cause and effect there, but those two things do happen simultaneously. Yeah? Um, is there anything throughout the period where you could differentiate between a Muslim and a Han in the way they dress, in the way they it depends entirely on where you are. In Fujian, of course, you cannot, because those folks are no longer practicing Muslims for the most part. In Gansu, you certainly can. Muslims tend to live around the mosque. They wear the white cap. They go to the mosque to pray. They are obviously different. Now, they don't look different in every place or every person. A lot depends on how long the ancestors have been inside the Chinese culture area. The, the descendants of fairly recent Central Asian in-migrants, of course, will look more Central Asian. But in Nanjing or Hangzhou, where tens of generations of intermarriage have gone by, of course, people will look very much like their non-Muslim neighbors. Now, why the intermarriage? I haven't talked about this at all because, again, I'm an evidence-based historian and we have no evidence about this. But we do know from general patterns in the world that where long-distance traders settle, they intermarry. Why? Because long-distance traders are men and they don't carry their wives with them. And so they marry where they land. And if they stay there, of course, intermarriage must be the rule. The women that they marry, of course, converted to Islam. They became Muslims by a religious act. 
but they were ethnically or racially or whatever you want to call it, genetically, local. And so the longer folks are in, and this is true everywhere you go, the longer folks are in a place having come as long distance traders, the more they physically resemble their neighbors. All right. Here we have a very interesting Manchu uh, political predilection, let's call it. The Manchus wanted very much to keep the peoples they had conquered separate. They divided their conquered peoples into five large basic groups. Manchus, Mongolians, Turks, Tibetans, and Chinese. And they wanted those five communities to remain as separate as possible. And so they created literally anti-miscegenation laws. You were not allowed to marry into one of those other big groups. Now who was required to wear the Manchu queue? Which is a horse tail, not a pigtail. Um, all Chinese were required to, all males of course. Chinese males were required to wear it. Now who is a Chinese male? How do you know? And decisions had to be made on a local basis with, lo with, with law because punishment had to be dealt out. If somebody was supposed to wear the queue and didn't, this was les majeste and, and it was a capital crime. So the question for our purposes is, does a Chinese speaking Muslim living in Hangzhou or Nanjing or even in Gansu or Yunnan have to wear the queue or not? Does a Turkish-speaking Muslim in Xinjiang have to wear the queue or not? And this had to be decided by statute. And it was. Anyone who is Chinese by culture, whether Muslim or not, must wear the queue. Anyone who is Turkic by culture, and they were almost all Muslims, though there were a few Buddhists remaining. Anyone who is Turkic by culture does not have to wear the queue, except their highest leaders, the Begs. Because the Begs had to go to Beijing and bow before the emperor, they had to wear the queue but no other Turkish-speaking Muslims had to wear it. So, Chinese-speaking Muslims had to wear the queue. Turkish-speaking Muslims did not. So you could tell a Turkic-speaking Muslim, of course, by his lack of queue, but also by his dress and his language. Chinese-speaking Muslims, unless they were wearing the distinctive white cap or living in the vicinity of the mosque, in many places could not be distinguished from their non-Muslim neighbors. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, just a comment about the traders, and you yes. said they married the locals. Yes. Well, of course, if they were Muslim, they could have more than one wife, so you could have a wife in each port. Yes, but remember, these are, these are folks who didn't return. Sure. One but I think for the original or the, the first the generation... Having, having more than one wife is also entirely Chinese. There's no problem with that. <laughs> the, problem, the problem is being far from home, and who do you marry? And how long are you going to stay? Remember that these people originally arrived in the Tang and Sung as ke, as sojourners, intending to go home. By the Yuan, the Sumu had settled and become local. And so it's in the Ming that we find Muslims already strongly resembling their neighbors because they might have been there for five or even ten generations and that's an awful lot of marrying local women. Uh, and those local women, as I said, would convert to Islam. Uh, finding husbands for your daughters is an extremely difficult problem in Muslim China. Uh, and that's true to this day. Uh, unless you live in one of the very large communities out on the northwest or the southwest, it's very often difficult to find men to marry your daughters. Yeah. Apology if it's a bit of a sidestep, but I'm interested in, at the same time, this was going on in China. Mm -hmm. In India, the British were perhaps raising the status of the Muslims yes. compared to the Hindus in, in bringing them into the, the government, and I'm just interested in the comparison, but it's perhaps wrong There had never been any discrimination as such against Muslims being in the Chinese government. Neither the, 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 the Yuan, of course, used the Sumu as government officials because they were Sumu. Uh, 
in the Ming and the Qing, anyone could become a government official if they passed the exams. Remember, this is a world of civil service examinations and had been since Song times. And so the, the Hui Ru, the Muslim Confucians, might very well have been people who studied for and passed the exams and were therefore eligible to serve the state. Ma Zhu, who was the writer of the Qing Zhan Zhen, the text I'm studying, the Yunnanese literatus, had passed the lowest level of exams. He was a Xiu Cai. He had passed the first exam. And had the Qing not conquered the Ming, he was a Ming exam taker, had the Qing not conquered the Ming, he might have gone on to a distinguished official career. And there were some Muslims who did. So being a Muslim was no bar. However, it did produce many complex situations for a Muslim, especially involving eating and drinking. Because Chinese officialdom was held together in part by what the anthropologists call commensality, the ability to sit down together and eat. And if one had to eat halal food, and if one did not drink alcohol, this would make it rather difficult to rise in the profession. Some Muslims did so, but they generally, as far as we know, and we have no hard data, so I'm on speculative ground here, they in fact violated the Islamic rules of eating and drinking in order to succeed in public office. We don't know that. We speculate it. But it would have been difficult for very many Muslims to do this primarily because so few Muslims became that literate in Chinese. They became literate enough to read. <clears throat> they could read a Khan Kitab text. But to take the exams required a measure of literacy that is almost inconceivable now. You had to be in, in effect, in memorized command of hundreds of thousands of pages of text. You had to memorize text at the most astonishing levels, even to pass the lowest levels of the exams. And very few people, Chinese, non-Muslim or Muslim, could do that. Now, hundreds of thousands of people did, but that's in a population of 450 million. So that, to, to succeed even at the first level of the exams was to enter into an elite status unapproachable by the vast bulk of the population. Some Muslims did that. Whether they did it at the expense of their own religious <clears throat> praxis or not remains to be seen. Ma Zhul, for example, we know was a practicing Muslim, a very conservative one, in fact. But he ended his official career in his 20s, went to Beijing and studied in the madrasa before writing the Qing Zhan Zhenan in the 1680s. So he did not continue on in the exam track because the Ming fell and the Ming was his dynasty. And as you know, a good Confucian does not serve two masters. And even the Qing praised such people for not serving them. They were called Bu'er the, 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 the ministers who do not serve two. And uh, they were highly respected folk, but of course out of a job. Uh, they mostly became teachers, as Ma Zhu did. He became a teacher. And he taught people who might have taken the exams later on. But then he switched tracks, which was fairly unusual, and studied the Islamic track rather than the Neo-Confucian track. The fascinating thing about Liu Zhi, his great successor, was that he studied both tracks to a very high level. Liu Zhi was a remarkable literatus in both the Chinese and the Islamic curriculum. And that was exceedingly rare. Okay, I believe it, isn't it time for prayers? Forgive me, I don't want to talk through that. So, um, any, one more question too? Should we stop? What, one more question. Anybody got one more or should we stop? Is it lunchtime? Please. Professor, may I take you back to the first session, please? Of course. Um, you um, um, mentioned uh, the categories of foreigners um, yes. in the context of Muslims and other minorities. Yes. Uh, I may be jumping the gun a bit, but I'm wondering what is the current uh, status in China, both in the cultural context 
and um, in the political setup. Lecture in, number five. In, in terms of representation, whether uh, communist or otherwise. I'll be talking about that at great length this yeah. afternoon. So thank that's, that's a major question. It's crucial. It's in the fifth lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm very grateful to you, first of all, for coming and then for staying. Very rarely do, well, none of my students have the fortitude to sit through this much of me. Uh, and I'm very grateful to you for doing so. Your questions have been wonderful. And uh, this has been a great learning day for me as well as, uh, as, well as a teaching day. And I'm, I'm very, uh, very pleased and grateful. Right, 1895. 1895. Uh, I, Obviously, I can't ask you to cast your minds back, but 18, 1895 is a watershed date in many ways, not just for, uh, for China, for Japan, for Korea, but also for the Muslims in China, and there are reasons for that. 1895, of course, is the date of the conclusion of the First Sino-Japanese War, a war in which the Qing was badly defeated by the rising Meiji state of Japan. It wasn't because the Qing armament was inferior. In fact, their armaments were almost identical as far as naval fleets were concerned. Uh, the Japanese army was slightly better equipped, but not that much better. The great advantage of the Japanese lay in training and leadership. The shock ran through the Qing Empire. It was uh, unbelievable that the great Qing would lose a war to what they unattractively called the dwarves from the Eastern Ocean. The Japanese victory stimulated the Qing to reform, to attempt to become a different sort of state, a modern country. And the beginning of that transformation, which some people date to a decade or two earlier, begins a time of extraordinary trauma and transformation in the Chinese world. The Qing is the last imperial state, the last kingdom, the last state led by a Huangdi, an emperor. But it also marks the beginning of the creation of China, a nation state, a modern state. One, as I tried to do at the very beginning of the first lecture, before that, one must always question where China is. Is China a cultural entity? Is it simply that which is enclosed by the frontiers of the current state ruling it? But in order to create a modern China, first Qing reformers and then their successors in the Republic had no choice but to create a very different kind of state, not a state which was dominated by an imperial center from which the charisma of the emperor emanated outward, but rather a state enclosed by borders within which a single government reigned more or less homogeneously. This is modern political theory, but I think it's persuasive. The difference between the Qing Empire and China the country is both considerable and traumatic. So, as we examine the history of Muslims in these traumatic times, obviously we have to take into account that not only are Muslims forced into a different world by modernity, but they are forced into it in a China which is being transformed as well. Which means we've probably got far too many variables to look at at any given moment. In 1895 and 1900, the Qing Empire was defeated by foreign armies. In 1895, Japan. In 1900, seven foreign countries. An eighth sent a contingent, but they arrived too late for the war. Uh, Chinese folks always talk about the eight-nation army, but in fact, it was only seven. Uh, the Germans arrived too late for the war. Uh, but a coalition of foreign powers, including Japan, the United States, Britain, and so on, defeated the Qing again in what's called the Boxer War. 
But by 1900, the Qing was impoverished by payment of indemnities. Both of these wars exacted enormous indemnities, cash. Remember that back in the 19th century, the losers paid cash for having lost. And so hundreds of millions of ounces of silver were drained from the Qing in indemnities for these two wars. And in the wake of these wars, reformers, many of them old-fashioned Qing bureaucrats, some of them Manchus, came forward to try and reshape the Qing into something more closely resembling a modern country. The model that they used was Japan. Japan was both the model and the hated enemy. And if, you, if you've ever talked to Chinese folks about Japan, you will hear precisely that ambivalence. Japan is truly hateful, but they've done what we want to do. They made it in the modern world, and we'd like to do that. And so Japanese educational ideals, for example, were taken in by people like Zhang Zhidong, pictured here. He's an old-fashioned Qing official, as you can see, really old school, but very reform-minded. And for him, education was the key to creating a China out of the Qing Empire. He envisioned it as a monarchy still. He envisioned the Qing Empire as continuing, but it was going to be a new kind of Qing Empire. And he coined the slogan, Chinese learning as the foundation, Western learning for function. And this is a stage through which all peoples go when confronted with this awe-inspiring might of Europe. Japan had as well. The Japanese had the same slogan in the 1850s and 1860s, Japanese spirit, Western science. And that make, it makes a certain amount of sense. It can't work, of course. It's an unworkable solution, but it is a, ne a necessary interim solution before people are willing really to dramatically transform their own culture. You have to be able to say, we're going to hang on to our cultural roots before, while, and after we take on this Western stuff in order to resist the menace. And in the case of the Qing, the menace was both Europe, the United States, North America, and Japan. So Zhang Zhidong with his, uh, the, the Chinese is, uh, is Zhong Xue Wei Ti, Xi Xue Wei Yong. Uh, his formula, unworkable in the long run, was an attempt to preserve that which he saw as most important about his own culture while adapting to the dangers of a world dominated by Euro-America and Japan. Now, the Muslims, of course, faced the same problem. They were, after all, Chinese and had to face these same dangers, but they were also attempting to remain themselves. How does one remain Muslim? in this same modern environment. And as you know, in every Muslim society, this has been a matter of considerable struggle, debate, hardship, transformation, and trauma. That meant that the Muslims were undergoing a double struggle. So it's not just Chinese learning as the foundation, it's Chinese and Islamic learning as the foundation, Western learning for function. That is even more difficult to maintain, as I'm sure all of you are aware. It is a very complex personal and collective transformation to be both modern and Chinese and Muslim. Yes, please. Yes. If one looks at the scenario in terms of science in Western countries, yes. uh, it doesn't come from the culture of the people. It centers on the military, large corporations, and much less the universities. So it's uh, really centered um, in uh, specific institutions. Um, and that is aimed to say uh, people in general are just the consumers. Are you arguing that science has nothing to do with culture? See, with that I would disagree. 
One can do that only that one, one can do that only if one's culture does not contradict science. And that, of course, is never the case. Because all cultures contradict science. Science is held to be this objective, uh, unemotional way of handling the world, experimental method, mathemat mathematization, and so on. Of course, the argument is universal that we can do science and be ourselves. But that is never done without struggle. Please, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Science as defined in terms of material science. Yes. Okay, uh, in terms of technology. Yes. Uh, that's the fear. What do you want to improve your um, infrastructure or mm -hmm. culture or trying to use it for your technology? Mm -hmm. In that area, I, I don't really think we should be any scientific. If you want to go the fundamentals of physics, you have to go to Australia and you connect to that. Well. Uh, but I think societies have to go through the applied route first, then progress slowly to the fundamentals of science. In the Chinese case, the science that had the most profound effect in requiring the dismantling of pre-modern culture was Darwinism. If one takes evolution seriously, there are very few pre-modern cultures that can handle it without alteration. And Darwinism was not simply a matter of corporations and the military and the elite. Darwinism, in a particular unscientific form, that is social Darwinism, which is a form of racism, was widely spread by Euro-America and widely believed by modernizing elites in East Asia. So that if one is to be a good social Darwinist, one sees racial groups or national groups locked as individuals in a struggle for survival of the fittest. There's no, there's no scientific basis to that whatsoever. In fact, it was spread in China primarily through translations of the works of Herbert Spencer, who was a sociologist, not a scientist, certainly not a biologist. So when I say science, in this case, what I'm talking about is popular science of a kind that included racial science with all of its pseudoscience, social Darwinism, and the notion that humankind can control nature, which is a very powerful one in 19th century science. And remember that the science that is doing the transforming here is 19th century science. It's not all simply industrial or military applications in the same way that European ways of thinking were transformed by the combination of Darwinism, Marxian political economy, Weberian sociology, Freudian psychology, and so on. That massive complex of things that happened in Europe between the beginning of the 19th and the middle of the 20th century, Europe was transformed by this means. You might not call it science, you might call it pseudoscience, but it was powerful stuff. And exactly the same stuff is washing up in East Asia in translation beginning smack on 1895. Now, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, let, uh, we'll, we'll get to this. The, the, the problem is a real one, and, and you're raising an important point. That is that science was by no means universal in Europe or Japan, if, if by that we mean mathem mathematized comprehension of nature. But you, ha you had another point. Okay, we'll talk. We'll have, we'll have, an, we'll have another bit later. Yes. Well, this is my last point anyway. Yes. Um, my understanding is the way science is perceived uh, by the China of that period, mm -hmm. India and Africa and so on, mm -hmm. perceived as an intellectual colonialism. Okay, colonialism is uh, because they conform. Oh, no. No, that's, that's not the case. It is a way of expanding through ideas and education and unhinging people. This is how it is perceived. That's my understanding by a lot of people who resisted this. Well, you see, in, in China, almost nobody, un, uh, almost nobody resisted it of any intellectual pretension. The intellectuals embraced it. So that by 1920, 
between 1895 and 1920, there's an enormous explosion of discourse, some of it profoundly conservative, some of it very Western-oriented, Westernizing. And that explosion in which Muslims partook, so it is directly relevant to what I want to say, Chinese Muslims partook of this explosion of discourse in which far from resisting Western science, Confucianism was pronounced the enemy. The family, as it had been constructed, was pronounced the enemy. And we must follow these two new leaders, Mr. Sai and Mr. De. Sai Xianzheng is Mr. Science. De Xianzheng is Mr. Democracy. So Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy are going to lead us into a new future in which the Qing is transformed into China and China transformed into a powerful modern country. And the, the model for this very obviously is Japan. So that because Japan had done this already, or apparently had, Chinese modernizers did not see the West as a colonizing discourse, but as a collection of universal truths. So we, there's a, this is very, very different from India or Africa, because you must remember that China was never colonized. China remained under Chinese administrations, however much influence Westerners might have had. The only parts of, of China that were colonized before the Second World War were Taiwan in 1895, southern part of Liaodong in 1905, and the rest of Manchuria in 1931. China proper was never colonized. And so the discourses emanating from Japan and the West were never attached to a political regime in which foreigners dominated. So that's, that's as close as I can get to an argument at the moment. We will talk about this more, though. So here we have Muslims participating in the reform of the Qing. Uh, this fellow right here is Ma Anliang, one of the warlords of Gansu. He's gathered together a group of his colleagues, all dressed remarkably similarly, as you see. And I wouldn't call this Mus Muslim costume in any way. This is Manchu costume that they're wearing. Um, to decide what to do about government because, and you probably all know this, I'll just put it in because we need to know it as a chronological point, the reforms fail. Revolutionaries take on the Qing, starting in 1895. In 1905, the Qing reforms itself by abolishing the old exam system. They begin a new structure of government with modern ministries, but it doesn't work. And the Qing collapses in 1912 to be replaced by a nominal republic. Ma Anliang and his boys want to participate in that process of transforming the Qing into a modern state of some kind. Ma Anliang, as it happens, supported a constitutional monarchy. He wanted the Qing to stay on. Some of his colleagues did not. They, re they supported the republic. And these are all Gansu Muslim leaders. So even amongst a small group, relatively homogeneous in background and geography, there was considerable disagreement about how to do this. How are we going to make China a safe, modern place where Muslims can live. One of the vehicles for doing this, as with non-Muslim Chinese, was periodicals. The proliferation of periodicals, especially after 1915, was truly remarkable. It went from a few dozen to a few hundred within five years. This was one of the most powerful of the Muslim periodicals, Yue Hua. Uh, Literally, the moon and China. Yue is the moon, the crescent moon, of course. Hua is China. So this is Muslim China or Islamic China. And Yue Hua published endless debates over modernity. Some of its correspondents studied in Japan. A few of them studied in the Middle East. And all of them were eager to present solutions as potential leaders of their communities, because these are, after all, the educated elite. These are the folks who can write Chinese, who can go to Tokyo and study in a modern school 
or go to Al-Azhar in, in Cairo. There were not very many such folks, and they worked very hard at becoming modern leaders for China and the Muslims of China. One of the first things they did was translate the Quran into Chinese. As you know, it, the translation was forbidden, but it had to be done precisely because the Quran as a meaningful document, as a way of understanding the world, couldn't mean anything to somebody who didn't know Arabic. And most modern Chinese did not know Arabic, except perhaps to pray. And so reading the Quran, if you were going to do it on your own, had to be done in Chinese. Pieces of the Quran had been translated before. The Khan Kitab contained many quotations from the Quran, but never had anyone attempted a complete translation. There was one attempted in, in the late Qing, in the 1870s, 1880s, by Ma Lianyuan in Yunnan, but he never published it. The first complete translation is published somewhere between 1907 and 1915, we're not sure. An open public translation in 1912. So the, tr the Quran is to be translated into Chinese. We are unambiguously Chinese. That is our language. We are also Muslims, and we must take this book with great seriousness. In order to do so, we must understand it. This is Ma Jian, the translator, a truly remarkable intellectual from Yunnan, in fact, from the same county as old Ma Zhu, who wrote The Compass of Islam. Ma Jian went to Al Azhar with the first delegation of Chinese students there, stayed, learned Arabic to a very high level. In fact, he translated the Analects of Confucius into Arabic, as well as translating the Quran into Chinese. An extraordinary man. He attempted to put into practice this idea of Western learning as the foundation. He was a modern man. Chinese and, uh, excuse me, Chinese and Islamic learning as the foundation, Western learning for function. That was his methodology, though he never used the slogan as far as I know. He knew what he wanted to preserve of Chinese culture ethics, morality, the zhongxue, the Chinese learning that he thought of. He knew what Islamic learning he wanted to, to retain. Religion, he was, he was a, a, a pious Muslim. But he was also a modern man. And the question is, how does one do those things at the same time? It's never a simple issue, and it's one that I think all of you can empathize with. People out in the Northwest, even in the Northwest, were caught up in this new trend of education, of a new kind, not simply going to the Jing Tang, to the scripture hall, to learn how to pray, but going to school to learn mathematics, science, English perhaps, or French, or German, or Russian, plus the Islamic curriculum. It was an additive process, not a replacement. And this is Shengli, established by the province. This is a public school. Di number one, Zhong A Chinese Arabic Xueqiao School. The first Sino Arabic school in the province of Ningxia. Ningxia was created as a province in 1928 and this school was created very shortly thereafter. Education was going to be the means by which, according to the leaders of this movement, Muslims could be modern Muslim Chinese. The Zhong Xiao, 1930 or 31 is my memory. Even at a national level, not just local, Muslim intellectuals took on the problem. In the early 1930s, a Sino-Muslim normal college was established, first in Jinan, in Shandong, 
and then moved to Beijing, which was not called Beijing at the time, but Beiping. Should you ever come across that Beiping business? That's what Beijing was called when Nanjing was the capital. Once Nanjing was made the capital in 1928, Beijing had to be renamed because Beijing means northern capital, Nanjing means southern capital. If, if Nanjing is the capital, Beijing has to become Beiping. So you'll see maps that say Beiping. That's just because they were made between 1938 and 1949, uh, 1928 and 1949. So this is in Beiping. Uh, you see these folks are still dressed in a very traditional way. They're wearing long robes. This is the long robes of a scholar. This is what scholars wear to differentiate them from ordinary people. But you'll notice one of the faculty members, the one in the left-hand corner, wearing a necktie and a Western-style suit. This is a harbinger of things to come. In the Republican period, 1912 to 1949, Chinese folks isolate four great Ahong, all of them modernists, all of them extraordinarily pious and learned imams, all of them engaged not simply with the problem of being a Muslim in the modern world, but with the problem of being a Chinese in the modern world. Now, what does that mean? The crucial concept here, of course, is nationalism. How does one take the Qing Empire and make it into a nation state, a national state, to which people will be loyal? How do you create, in other words, nationalist Chinese? And in this case, how do you create nationalist Chinese Muslims? It's not a simple process. The curricular arguments go on and on and on in the pages of Yuehua. How much of this should we study? How much of that should we study? How much attention should we pay to developments in the Middle East? Remember, these folks are attached to the Middle East through the Chinese students at Al-Azhar, through people who travel. They know about Ataturk. They know about the transformation of Turkey from an Islamic state to a secular state. They know the arguments that went along with that. They know about the Khilafat movement in South Asia. They know about British colonialism. They know what's going on in Egypt and Lebanon. They are not detached from the world. Quite the contrary. And these guys, in different ways, some as leaders of schools, others as leaders of mosques, others as public intellectuals, talk, public, uh, publicly publish and teach trying to solve these problems. These are remarkable men, truly, and uh, no study of Muslim modernism should eliminate them. A recent volume of texts uh, on Muslim modernism, uh, in fact, contains some fascinating excerpts from the work of Wang Jingjai, the, the, the fellow on the upper left. He was a prolific writer, a modernist, and an imam who wrote quite a lot about what it means to be a patriotic Chinese Muslim. Then there were other Muslim roles, one of the most important of which was in the military. You would think, given the history that I told you before, that most of these Muslim military men came from the Northwest, and indeed they did. But the fellow on the right, Bai Chongxi, comes from the Southwest, not from Yunnan, but from Guangxi. And all of these militarists ended up in the nationalist military, in the army, that is, of Chiang Kai-shek and the Guomindang. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going too fast or too far to note that by the early 1920s, there are two contending political parties in China, the Guomindang, or nationalist party, under the leadership of Sun Yat-sen, and the Gongchandang, or communist party, under the leadership of Chen Duxiu who had been the dean of the faculty of Beijing University, a major intellectual. Those two parties unified briefly in the 1920s in order to take on what they both saw as their main en enemies, imperialism, which had not colonized China but dominated its coastal cities, and warlordism, because the republic had never come together. In fact, it had fragmented 
there wasn't a viable central government in China from 1916 to 1928. And in those years, these guys ran their own armies, had their own militaries, but all of them proclaimed the ideal of unification. We must have a united China. And to that end, all three of these fellows joined the nationalists, the Guomindang, which after the death of Sun Yat-sen came under the leadership of the fellow known in English as Chiang Kai-shek. His Chinese name, his Mandarin name is Jiang Jieshi. Now, uh, I'll use the Chiang Kai-shek pronunciation because it's the most familiar, but that's not a Mandarin pronunciation. It's a local dialect. Anyway, these three generals were diff very different from one another. Uh, the one on the left, as you see him posing in the, in, the co in the costume of a scholar, fancied himself quite a good calligrapher. And he, in fact, was. Uh, this is Ma Fuxian. Uh, unfortunately for the Northwest, he was, he was its most successful leader, and he died young in the early 1930s. The middle guy is Ma Hongkui, who is pretty much universally reviled as a butcher. He was a nasty man. The fellow on the right is, in some ways, more interesting, Ma, uh, Bai Chongxi from Guangxi. All three of these guys very differently engaged with the nationalist military to try and make a modern China. The idea being that without some sort of military unification, we couldn't really have a country. And there's some, there's some good sense in that. Now, I'm going to tell you about four more leaders. You don't have to remember their names. I'm just going to give you stories. Because these four guys, they happen to be four of the people I've studied most closely. All were leaders in the Northwest, they're all from the same area, but they chose remarkably different ways to handle this problem of being a modern Chinese Muslim. Ma Qi Xi had studied in the conventional Confucian exam system. He was a Muslim, but he had taken the lower level exam and passed. So he was a Confucian student, but he also became quite conversant with the Han Kitab. That is to say, he read the Muslim texts in Chinese. He could also read Arabic well. He had lived for several years in Central Asia. We don't quite know where. The closest guess anybody's come is Samarkand, but we don't really know that. And in the early 20th century, in the last years of the Qing, he came back to Gansu, persuaded that the way to be a modern Chinese Muslim was to understand Islam in Chinese. That is that the Han Kitab held the key to being a modern Chinese Muslim. And so he set up a school in his hometown, which was way out in the back of beyond, in southern Gansu. He set up a school to teach the Han Kitab. It met with an awful lot of local resistance because the more conservative imams knew that one had to transmit Islam in Arabic not in Chinese. There was a lot of conflict. And in order to, how shall we say, make his vision concrete, Ma Chi Xi decided that he couldn't just teach school, that he would have to develop a long-term institutional basis for Muslim prosperity in order for his ideas to flourish. And so he established a collective Islamic, I don't know quite what to call it. The closest analogy is a kibbutz. It was a collective. To join it, one donated all of one's property to the collective. If you were a full member, you belonged to the collective. The collective, you as collective assigned you work on the basis of your abilities, and you worked for the collective, not for pay. All the wealth that you generated went to the collective. This is called the Xi Dao Tang, the hall of the Western Dao. The Western Dao, of course, is Islam. Ma Qi Xi was a remarkable organizer and produced a very successful collective. Within a decade or so, they owned thousands of acres of farmland flour mills, 
pasture land and flocks, factories. In short, it was one way of becoming a modern Chinese Muslim. Other leaders in the province were not pleased, and one of them, one of the militarists you've seen in a previous picture, came down to his town, dragged him and about 20 of his followers out and shot them. Be and this was a Muslim warlord, uh, because they were commercial rivals. Fortunately, Ma Qi Xi's institution continued and continues to this day. The Xi Dao Tang now has about 10,000 full members, and it still exists in southern Gansu. It has expanded its activities to include factories in eastern China, an enormous fleet of trucks, little pickup trucks, through which it delivers goods and picks up goods from Tibetan producers in the highlands. It's become a truly remarkable economic institution. Yeah. Okay, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll see if I can find a map and show you. I don't think I have a map in this section. Um, yes. 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 Uh, Ma Qi Xi, before he, before he founded the Xi Datang, was a member of one of the Sufi Man Huan. And presumably the organization of the Xi Datang owed a lot to the organization of a Sufi hospice. But it was larger and it was collective property holding, which the ordinary Sufi hospice is not. But yes, it did owe quite a bit to the organization of Sufi orders. Whether, whether the practice of the Xi Datang is Sufi or not, somebody who has a better grasp of religion than I will have to say. Their documents, which is what I have, uh, the documents of the Xi Dao Tang do not call themselves Sufis. Uh, they call themselves Muslims. But uh, it's a fascinating institution. I've visited and had lengthy discussions. Uh, there's now a huge literature about it because it's quite spectacularly different from all other Muslim institutions in China. And so people are very curious about it. And there's now a world of scholarship but it is very, very successful. Because of its location, which is in southern Gansu province, on the cultural boundary between Han China, cultural China, and cultural Tibet, the Muslims of the Xi Dao Tang made a lot of their money as middlemen, brokers, moving Tibetan produce down to Han towns and Han produce up to Tibetan grasslands. Quite an extraordinary institution. In its schools, inside the collective, they taught Chinese so that they could read the, the texts in Chinese, Arabic so that they could pray, and they are very pious, and Tibetan, so that many of the young folks coming out of the Xi Datang schools were trilingual. Yeah? Well, Tibetan and Chinese as language systems are only very vaguely connected. They are quite, quite different. Yes. Well, what's the problem? <laughs> Ask any Swede. Uh, you know, p young people can learn an enormous number of languages if they're exposed early and for good reasons. Uh, I have plenty of friends who were, who were quadrilingual before they finished secondary school. And it's not at all unusual. Young people have an extraordinary capacity to absorb language. And uh, they just have to be taught early enough. Yes? Well, it's a collective. They grow up in it. You know, it's, it's a kibbutz. You know, you grow up in the collective situation, and you go to school in it, and you work for it as an adult. Your life is circumscribed by it, but also profoundly enriched, because you belong to this entity. It's also a commercial entity. It has a commercial brand, Tianxinglong, and the Tianxinglong brand is now all over China. You can find Tianxinglong shops practically everywhere. But they still specialize in trade between lowland China and highland Tibet. Uh, I visited one of their factories in Hangzhou. It's a silk filature, a, a silk factory. 
where they specialize in dyeing silk to colors that Tibetans like. And they cart this stuff up the Yangtze, through the Shidatang headquarters in southern Gansu, and up into the highlands to sell it to Tibetans. Specially designed because these are colors that Tibetans like. A lot of the, a lot of the robes of the Tibetan monks at the monasteries you're going to visit in northeastern Tibet when you go there as a tourist were made by Shidatang factories in Hangzhou. Okay, so that's one. Yeah. There was never another headquarters. There was never a headquarters. No, the headquarters is there in southern Gansu, outside the city of Lintan Jiucheng. But uh, they have branches, commercial shops, processing facilities, factories all over the place. The collective itself is based in one place. And uh, my memory, when I was last there, which was in 1996, is that about a thousand families lived at the base. And the rest was scattered about in all kinds of enterprises. Yeah, Mizan. Saw a lot of them in Israel. <laughs> uh, no. No, this is, a re this is a remarkable institution developed by a remarkable fella. Uh, if Ma Anliang wanted to keep these people from dominating the province, he was probably right to shoot them because they were very, very good. And unfortunately for Ma Anliang's ambition, the institution continued and continues. Yes. 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 No other of this kind has been founded in China that I know of. So that's number one. It's a solution. Use Chinese to transmit the teaching, Arabic for orthodox practice, Tibetan for trade, collective ownership for success in business, good planning. The slogan by local people who are outside of it, uh, it's, it's a fascinating slogan, on the inside communist, on the outside imperialist. Uh, <laughs> because they were so competitive in business that they looked like imperialists to other businesses. So that's, that's one set of solutions. Here's another. Ma Yuan Zhang, the fellow on the right, was the sheikh of the Jahriya, one of the old Sufi orders that had come to China in the 18th century. He was an extraordinarily well-educated man in both Islamic and Chinese curricula. He was quite expert at writing Chinese poetry and especially at what are called parallel couplets, duilian, and his duilian are known throughout the Northwest. He was really good at that. He is known to have made three copies of the Quran in his own handwriting and to have produced a corpus of Chinese written essays, poems, and couplets. A remarkable fellow, a very serious Sufi. Uh, we have a magnificent doctoral dissertation from an Australian uh, student analyzing the texts that we have from the life of this man. His followers sat in the anteroom of his zawiya doing numerological analysis of Arabic texts. They really knew the tradition. They were serious Sufis. But they were also Chinese nationalists. They weren't separatists. They weren't trying to withdraw away from Chinese culture. In fact, they wanted to be more and more a part of it. He was known in the Northwest as a supporter of the Republic. For him, the Republic had to succeed for Chinese Muslims to have a rightful place in the world. Unfortunately, he too died young. In Gansu in 1920, there was a great earthquake. 250,000 people died in eastern Gansu in one morning in 1920, and Ma Yuanzhang was one of them. He and his son were killed, ironically and sadly, at prayers when the mosque collapsed in the earthquake. He's a remarkable man, and he too sought a Chinese Muslim modern solution. He did use the Chinese texts, the Han Kitab texts, but he was also deeply immersed in the Sufi tradition in Arabic and Persian. He believed 
that everyone who is to be a serious modern Chinese Muslim should be engaged with the state, but also learned in both curricula. This is a very hard road to hoe. But that was the one he advocated. This is Ma Fuxian. You, you met him before in a previous slide. A general, member of a, one of the old military families that had joined with the Qing in the aftermath of the Great Rebellion of the 1860s. Ma Fuxiang had gone through the military exam system of the Qing and ex excelled in it. But he also had very good calligraphy. And for him, the route to the future was not to build up his constituency there in Gansu, as Ma Yuanzhang did in his Zawiya, and as Ma Qixi did in his kibbutz. For him, joining the national party and making Islam a national force in China was the way to go. He joined the Guomindang party and rose in it very quickly. He became mayor of Tianjin. He became head of the Mongolian, Affairs Com Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission and a commander of the Air Force. He was a remarkable man. Sad to say, died young. Uh, he wasn't shot by Ma Anliang. He, he died of illness, but he did not succeed in the end in passing on his heritage of nationalist Muslim Chineseness because his son became that brutal warlord who was, in the end, reviled by the local people rather than followed as a leader. And finally, Ma Wanfu. I don't have a picture of Ma Wanfu because he never allowed his picture to be taken. Ma Wanfu chose a completely different route. For him, Chinese, Muslim, nationalist was impossible. He went to Saudi Arabia. He went on the Hajj and stayed and studied at a time when and this is not meant as an epithet, but as an accurate description of his studies, when Wahhabi influence was very powerful. He studied the texts of Abd al-Wahhab, the ideas that went into the Muslim Brotherhood, not the Egyptian one, but the Saudi one. And he came back to China and founded a Muslim Brotherhood in China, the objective of which was withdrawal from Chinese culture. For him to, to participate as a nationalist Chinese Muslim was to, to try to live an impossible contradiction. So he withdrew. He tried to found an organization that would achieve the pure body of Islam by rejecting all Chinese accretions. I'm sure this is language that's familiar to you. It didn't work. Within a generation, Hu Songshan, his disciple, had become a Chinese nationalist. There are reasons for this, the most obvious of which is that in the course of Ma Wanfu's life and his training of Hu Songshan, the world changed. Ma Wanfu went on his pilgrimage in the 1890s, when he could go to, to Saudi Arabia and live, particularly east of the holy cities, almost with the Wahhabi uh, group, the, the Saud family essentially trying to take over the holy cities to take them away from the Ottomans. And so for him, this was a holy quest. When Hu Songshan went on his pilgrimage, it was the mid-1920s, when the holy cities were more or less controlled by the British. And he met with discrimination, not because he was a Muslim, but because he was Chinese. And so when he came back to China from his pilgrimage, he was determined that the only thing that could make his life and that of his community viable was a strong, internationally respected China. And so he became a Chinese nationalist. This was, of course, accelerated 
by the actions of Japan. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say about the discrimination against the European Imperialists that were local Muslims. The, the, local, the local Muslims took on attitudes. It's very difficult to be ruled by or, or even influenced by imperialists and not come to think that some of the things they think are right are right. Oh no, these are Muslims. Oh, they're, these are, these are long-term Muslim families. The changes in their lives are contextual and doctrinal. Mawanfu went to Arabia, came back to found a Muslim Brotherhood, to reject Chinese culture. His disciple, Hu Songshan, went to Arabia and came back determined to build a strong China. The teachings were the same. The results were radically different. This fella and his disciples found, didn't found, they continued Ma Wanfu's un organization under the same name. It's called the Ikhwan, Ikhwan al-Muslimun. But instead of being a rejectionist, anti-accretionist Wahhabi group, they're Muslim Chinese nationalists. And the Ikhwan remains to this day the single largest and most powerful organ Muslim organization in China. It controls hundreds of mosques and is the main force in many national Muslim organizations such as the All China Muslim Association and, uh, and others based in Beijing. Ikhwan is still very powerful. Yeah, Mizan. Um, they, they they, they, their main focus at the moment, apart from orthopraxy and orthodoxy, is anti-Sufism. This picture was taken, I think, a year or two ago on the left in a large Ikhwan mosque. So here we have four different leaders, all from the same half of the same province. Ma Qixi with his collective, uh, Ma Yuanzhang leading the Jahriya, Ma Fuxiang becoming a general and a member of the Guomindang and practicing his calligraphy, Chinese calligraphy, and Ma Wanfu attempting to withdraw and failing all trying in the 1920s and 1930s to make a viable place for Muslims in modern China. Ma uh, not invariably. There are lots of non-Muslim Ma's, but there are mo Ma is the most common surname among the Chinese Muslims. Uh, but it's a, uh, for, for, that means for every 10 Muslims, nine are named Ma. Uh, the, the common folk wisdom, we have no proof of this in any scholarly way, but the folk wisdom is that it comes from Muhammad. Uh, the surname Mu is also a fairly common one among Chinese-speaking Muslims. Remember, all, all Chinese surnames are monosyllables. And so in order to make a, an Islamic name into a Muslim name, you have to, or rather into a Chinese name, you have to reduce it to a single syllable. Um, for example, uh, one of the sons of Sayyid Ajal Shamsuddin, the guy who conquered Yunnan for the Mongols, one of his sons was Nasruddin. And from Nasruddin descend two Chinese surnames, Na and Ding. <laughs> and so the Na family and the Ding family in Yunnan both claim descent from the Prophet through Nasruddin, who was the son of Sayyid Ajal. And that is how you convert Islamic names into Chinese names. You have to make them monosyllables, which is why Ma has become so popular a name. At least that's the folk wisdom. I really don't know. Nobody knows. But that's the claim. That every, it, that's what you'll hear. If you ask anybody, why are so many Hui Hui named Ma, they will tell you because of Muhammad. Now I come to the last point in this lecture, which is, what are we? Who are we, the Muslims of China? Obviously, this is a debate that would, would take place only amongst intellectuals. In the pages of those modern periodicals I mentioned before, there was a, a huge argument with many, many articles on either side about whether we are Chinese, Han that is, 
who believe in Islam. In Chinese, this would be called the Hui Jiao Shuo, the theory of Islam as religion. Or are we a separate ethnic group? This would be called the Hui Zu Shuo, the Hui as ethnic group theory. Now, obviously, neither of these is right or wrong. The question is, which wins? And oddly enough, both of them do. In the Republic of China, which lasted on the mainland until 1949 and continues to the present day in Taiwan, we, the Chinese Muslims, are Han Chinese who believe in Islam. On the mainland, we are the Huizu. We are a separate ethnic group. And I'm going to talk about the rise of that notion soon. To the, to the right, Bai Shoui, a Muslim communist Chinese, which is a really interesting combination. <laughs> and one of the greatest historians of 20th century China, a remarkable intellectual. For him, it was absolutely clear that we Hui are a Zhu, we are an ethnic group, separate by blood from the Han. On the left, Gu Jiagang, probably the greatest historian of 20th century China, bar none. A truly remarkable intellectual for whom it was equally clear that the Hui are just Han who believe in Islam. In fact, he posited a theory that all five of the great ethnic groups of the Qing, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Muslims, the Tibetans, and the Chinese were in fact consanguineous, a single ethnicity. And he, he, he wrote elaborate theories to demonstrate this, and it is in fact the theory that was in the end accepted by Chiang Kai-shek, that we are all of one blood. The communists, on the other hand, accepted the theory of Bai Shou Yi, that the, that the Hui are a separate Minzu, a separate ethnic group. The word Minzu is one that you're going to hear a lot in the, in the last lecture, because it is into Minzu that the Chinese Communist Party divides its population. There are 56 of them. You all know that number? 56? Remember the number 56. It's going to be part of our discussion later on. But this debate, I'm not going to tell you why anybody would win, because neither of these is in any sense an accurate description of reality. Reality is always much more complex than that. But the fact is the debate took place. The Nationalist Party allied itself with Gu Jiagang's position, the Communist Party with Bai Shoui's. Okay? Do we have to stop? Or? Oh, no, you can keep oh, okay. That's a question. Right, it's question time. So, that's the Republican period. We're going to go on to the Communists in a bit. Yes, sir? Where does the name Hui come from? The name Hui is a, an abbreviation of Hui Hui, which was initially Hui He, which means Uyghurs. <laughs> There's irony in that because now everybody in China knows that the Uyghurs and the Hui are two completely separate ethnic groups, same name. The generalization is a very, the, the, the derivation is a very complex one. It begins in the Song and ends in the Ming. It lasts several centuries with several transformations, but obviously the Mongols play an important part in it. The question is, what names do we use for different kinds of people? Uh, by, the Ming, by the time the Ming Code was written, as I showed you before, Hui Hui meant Muslims. But in the, in the Yuan period, very often, Hui simply meant people from the West who aren't Chinese. So Christians might be called Hui. Zoroastrians might be called Hui. So it's more like Hui He, meaning Uyghur. And in the Song period, it clearly meant somebody from the West. So people with big noses from the West were Hui He. Then through a complex evolution, turned into two words, one for Uyghur, the other for Chinese-speaking Muslims. That's the derivation. Oh, absolutely. The Hui and the Uyghurs are two radically separate ethnic groups, but they share a name. In fact, the derivation is from the one to the other. Uh, 
Remember that the Uyghurs have played a part in Chinese history since the Tang, but they were not Muslims. The Uyghurs didn't become Muslims until the Mongol period or a little later, uh, during the conversion of the Turks to Islam, which is a long and complex process, as I'm sure you all know, the Eastern Turks, who are now called Uyghurs, uh, were among the last to be converted to Islam. Xinjiang, that whole monstrous area out there on the upper left-hand corner of China, uh, took about 300 years to Islamize. It was not done by warfare, but by Sufis, by merchants, by Imams, who moved from place to place and converted people. We know that there were Muslims in Kashgar as early as about the mid-Sung period, but it's not until about 1430, that is, early to mid-Ming, that Hami, the, the easternmost oasis of Xinjiang, becomes a Muslim town. So it takes about 300 years. Yeah. Do you know if there's been any modern DNA um, uh, review of, of, of the people and to see if... if uh, I'm sure there has and I don't care. <laughs> Be precisely because to me blood means very little. Uh, I don't, I, I think I don't find blood convincing. I think it's interesting f historically to see the migration of people. To look at migration patterns it is absolutely fascinating and there's no question that people who are now Uyghurs are Turkish both in culture and presumably in genetics. The people who are called Hui are an extraordinarily diverse group, both culturally and genetically, depending on where they are and how long ago their ancestors came to the Chinese culture area. I've met families up in Qinghai whose ancestors came to the Chinese culture area only a, a generation or two ago. They still look very Central Asian, but they are Hui because they speak Chinese as their native language. Uh, on the other hand, if you go down to Fujian, to these descendants of Muslims, They've been intermarrying since the Song, perhaps. And it would be very difficult to find that, quote, Muslim blood, end quote. And of course, this is a major question throughout the Muslim world. It, can one be a Muslim by blood? Is there such a thing? Or is praxis, belief, faith, iman, the only real test of being a Muslim or not? You know, just because your name is Muhammad doesn't mean you're a Muslim. And of course, many of the contemporary Hui and Uyghurs are atheists, members of the Chinese Communist Party, people who long ago gave up any pretense at practicing Islam. Are they Muslims or are they not? And we're going to get to that in the next talk. Sir. about the Muslim identity in China. Yes. Um, it has been within the sort of Chinese heart, heartland and not the, the Western Oh, uh, absolutely. Western this is a debate. Of, it, um, the word Hui appears in both of these discourses. So it, mean, it, it excludes the Uyghurs. It in, excludes the Turkish speakers. Uh, so I, I was wondering, um, what were the relations and, and discussions between, um, if any, between the, um, uh, the, the, the Muslims in the Chinese heartland and the Muslims in the... Um, the extension of China? Um. Un unfortunately, and we know a lot about this, this is well documented, the presence of Chinese-speaking Muslims in the Turkic-speaking world of Xinjiang has been largely antagonistic. That is, there have been instances of intermarriage, there have been instances of mutual understanding, but uh, Chinese-speaking Muslims came to Xinjiang primarily as traders and remained quite separate from the Uyghur-speaking population because they spoke Chinese. They looked Chinese. Hell, they are Chinese. And that distinction became quite a wide gulf. Now, this got a lot worse when the Qing fell apart because out in the West, Xinjiang was ruled by a succession of Chinese warlords who were very, very unpleasant people as a general rule. They were mostly old Qing officials who were hanging on to territory in order to amass as great a fortune as they possibly could. Their soldiery was largely Chinese-speaking Muslims. 
And so the Uyghurs, the local people, who only started calling themselves Uyghurs, incidentally, in the 1920s. The word Uyghur did not exist from about 14 or 1500 until the 1920s. Nobody used it. And I can tell you what those folks called themselves, if you'd like. But the point is that the constabulary and the soldiery of the province were mostly Chinese-speaking Muslims and horrifically oppressive. So that the Hui got a very, very bad reputation in Xinjiang. And that problem has remained to the present day. Uh, in, the next, in the next talk, I've got a slide of two very different mosques in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, uh, a Hui mosque and a Uyghur mosque, and they don't go to one another's mosques. Nowadays, in certain parts of northwest China, Hafiya people, Jahriya people, Ikhwan people, Shidaotang people go to one another's mosques. Their, their imams preach on Fridays in one another's mosques. But in Xinjiang, that Hui Uyghur gap has proved much more difficult to cross. It's a sad story, really, but a true one. Yes? Oh, we do have a fair amount of data on this. Uh, if you were to ask somebody in the streets of Kashgar, say, in 1800, who are you? you'd get three basic answers. There would be a lot of individual difference, of course, but three basic answers. Turk, I'm Turkic. Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Yarluk, I'm from here. I'm local. <laughs> Those are the three. I'm an Aksulik. I'm from Aksu. I'm a Kashgarlik. I'm from a Kashgar. I'm a Turpanlik. I'm from Turpan. So local identity, oasis, Islam, Turkic language. The word Uyghur would not appear. The Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, Muslims in Soviet Central Asia had that name for the Muslims who lived around the Taklamakhan and started using it inside the Soviet nationalities discourse, which was designed by a fellow called Stalin. Stalin was Lenin's nationalities guide. You know why? Because he was a Georgian. Stalin wasn't Russian. And to have a nationalities guy, you've got to have somebody who is from one of the nationalities, and it was either Stalin or a Jew. <laughs> Lenin chose Stalin. And Stalin designed Soviet nationalities policy. And within that nationalities policy appeared the ethnonym Uyghur which is a very old one, and had been used by some people, particularly in eastern Kazakhstan. And so Uyghur was used by Soviet people to describe the Turkic-speaking Muslims of southern Xinjiang, and it gradually gained currency. By the end of the 1920s, beginning of the 1930s, it was commonly used by the Uyghurs, the people who are now called Uyghurs themselves, to describe themselves. Interestingly, a fifth, you can still find Turk, though people say it very quietly. Musulman, of course. I'm from Aksu or Turpan, of course. Uyghur, main one. But there's a, there's a, a fifth one that's developed really in the past 40 years. Uh, it's a new one, and it tends to be most popular among those Uyghurs who do business in an eastward direction, that is, who do business with China. They call themselves Jungola. Zhongguo, of course, is the Chinese word for China. And so a Zhongguolok is a Uyghur, because Lok is a person of, in Uyghur Turkish. Zhongguolok is a Chinese person. And so that ethnonym has come to be of some currency, especially in eastern Xinjiang. You'd never hear it in Kashgar. Never. But in Turpan, you'd hear it. And here again, I'm going to insist, even if I'm not showing you maps and where things are, that it really matters where you are. That Xinjiang isn't one place. Gansu isn't one place. Muslims of China aren't one thing. I'm going to insist on local specificity because it really does matter. Just Final question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, a short question on, on um, the generals. Um, oh, yes, the Muslim warlords. To what extent were they able to practice Islam 
To what extent were the Muslim generals able to practice Islam? It, it varied tremendously. It varied a great deal. There were some of these generals who, with their troops, prayed daily. Some of them couldn't have cared less. The ones who were the most orthodox were probably those warlords who were associated with the Ikhwan. That is, with the Wahhabi ideas that had come back from Arabia with Mawanfu. They were known to be orthopractic. Uh, Ma Chi, for example, the, 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 the Muslim warlord of Xining, uh, regularly prayed with his troops. In fact, he was the one who employed Ma Wanfu uh, as his house imam. And it remains the case that Xining City, which is way out on the northern edge of Tibet, Xining City is an Ikhwan stronghold to this day. So it, it depends very much on who you're talking about and when. But uh, some of them were almost entirely secularized. I don't know how often Mafus Yang prayed, and if, his, if he and his brothers advocated the Ikhwan, it was strictly cynical and political because it was popular. Okay? This slideshow and lecture has by, by necessity far more data but far more controversial issues. History we can always separate from ourselves, but this is China as it is now, or as it has been recently, say within the past half century. And I'm going to have to speak very, very carefully in order to avoid not stepping on people's toes, but to avoid the kinds of generalizations that people make in Sino-Muslim studies in studies of the so-called ethnic or national minorities in China. Big statements are the rule, not the exception, and they're almost always wrong. So I'm going to have to tread cautiously, and you'll forgive me if I get a bit prolix, because these are very difficult questions. It is not simple to analyze what has happened to not the Muslims, but to Muslims, in China over the, past, uh, over the past 60 years. In 1949, having fought a, oh gosh, shall we say, eight-year guerrilla war against the Japanese, and then an incredibly violent three-year civil war against the Guomindang, the Communist Party of China emerged victorious. Uh, you probably don't know this, but the largest war in terms of cost, human cost and numbers of soldiers involved, the largest war since World War II is the Chinese Civil War of 1946 to 1949. Somewhere in the vicinity of three million troops were engaged on either side. It was a gigantic war and a very costly one in human and material terms. The communists won. As you know, the good guys always win the war. Uh, in, chi in Chinese, we say, shang uh, wei wang, bai zhe wei kao. The winner a king, the loser a bandit. And, and so the winners get to write the history. And the virtue that produced this victory has been much touted. This is called a peasant war, a war of the people against the bourgeoisie, a role against the vicious tools of imperialism and so on. But in fact, the war was fought by peasants on both sides. And the side with the better generals, the better training, and the better troops won. It was a war, a military operation. Mao Zedong stood on the gate of heavenly peace in front of the old imperial city in Beijing and proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. China has stood up. We are no longer going to put up with these imperialists and these warlords. We are China, an independent country. This was very stirring stuff after all those years of division and warlords and party politics. People were pretty enthusiastic about it. And that included some Muslims. 
Some Muslims, of course, were no longer in China. They had fled to Taiwan with the nationalists. And they remained there, or they went on. Uh, Ma Hongkui, the, the butcher of the Northwest, ended up in Los Angeles, where he raised horses, actually, for the rest of his life. And his grandchildren are still raising horses outside of Los Angeles, his great-grandchildren, too. But most of them stayed, and most of them would attempt to come to terms with a victory that at the time was, yes, attributed to the communists, but primarily by virtue of their nationalism. Communist doctrine had not yet been put into practice. It certainly didn't feel like the Soviet Union. It felt like a liberated China. Here are some key terms that you're going to have to know in order to understand what I'm talking about. The most obvious is the word minzu, which is a Japanese word. The word had existed in China, in Chinese texts before, but it didn't mean what it means now. What it means now is essentially the German das Volk. It means a national group defined by blood. In fact, it was created with that meaning by a Japanese translator of German who had to figure out how to say das Volk in Japanese and decided to use this combination of Chinese characters. Now it has become a political term and I'll tell you how that came to be in a minute. The Minzu Shirbye, the ethnic classification project of the PRC, which was undertaken in the 1950s, identified, and I put it in quotation marks because I'm re really not sure that they were identifying things that were actually there, 56 Minzu in addition to the Han, which was defined as the vast majority of the citizens of the PRC. The word Hui Hui, as you asked about it before, a Chinese-speaking Muslim who might earlier have been called a Hui Jiao Tu, an adherent of Islam, but is now known usually as a Hui Zhu, a member of the Hui Minzu. Social Darwinism, again, you asked about it before, an ideology now largely discredited as having no scientific basis whatsoever, claiming that human groups and individuals are subject to the same Darwinian laws of natural selection as plants and animals, and that human groups, very often races, Minzu, national citizenries, and so on, act as Darwinian individuals. Darwin's biological laws, of, of course, apply only to individual organisms. Individual organisms struggle for the survival of the fittest, not species. Organisms. Social Darwinism implies that human groups struggle as individuals for the survival of the fittest. And finally, Sufism, the esoteric dimension of Islam, the path, tariqa in Arabic, dao in Chinese, to personal union with the divine, requiring a guide, a sheikh, or a teacher to practice the mystical techniques, such as deep breathing, chanting, dancing, and so on. Most of you know these last two terms, but the first three might be new to you. Identifying or inventing the national minorities. In, in the early 1950s, it was not at all clear who, who the citizens of the People's Republic of China were. And by virtue of their ideology and their relationship with the Soviet Union, the leaders of the People's Republic of China decided to use Stalin's policies and techniques to decide, to figure out, to identify, if you will, who the citizens of the People's Republic were by nationality. Uh, I presume the Russian word in question is narod, but I don't know that. It might be natsia, but I think it's narod. In any case, how are you going to do that in, a, in an immense, poor country with a population of over 600 million? Well, the first thing they did in the early 1950s was to gather ethnonyms, the names that people used to call themselves and others. And they gathered over 400 of them that were current inside the People's Republic. So you have a bunch of scholars, anthropologists, and linguists, and sociologists, and so on, gathering all these ethnonyms and trying to think, how are we going to do this business of identifying the, nation, the national groups that we know are there, 
and which have to be named according to this Soviet-style pol policy. In 1953, came down from the center a command to these scholars who were employed by the state on this work of figuring out how to identify who the citizens of the People's Republic of China might be, came down the word, every minzu, every national group that we identify, must have a representative in the National People's Congress, which is the rubber stamp legislature of the Chinese Communist Party. How many minority representatives can we possibly tolerate? And the center came up with an answer. They didn't explain it. But the answer was 60. 60. Came down the word to all these provincial level academic groups who were going to go out into the world and identify the groups. No more than 60. That's how many we can have. Mirabile dictu. They came up with 56. How did they do that? This is how they did that. Teams of social scientists, linguists primarily, but also anthropologists and sociologists, went out into the villages on the frontiers of China, wherever these ethnonyms appeared, and tried to decide whether those people called by that ethnonym did or did not constitute a minzu. Now you'll remember perhaps Stalin's criteria for being one of those things, a narod or a natsia or a minzu. Common language, common territory, common economy, common either psychology or culture, depending on how you translate. Those are the four Stalinist criteria for minzuhood, plus no more than 60. So we start with 400 ethnonyms, and our job is to shake that down to a number less than 60. Here we have people who are obviously Han Chinese arriving at a village in Hainan Island. Uh, I don't have a map right here at the moment, but Hainan Island is that large island that sort of drops off the bottom of China in, into the South China Sea. It's a very large island, and its population is to some extent Malay. These are Muslims who speak Malay as their native language. Those are the folks who are greeting these social scientists. And the question is, whatever are they doing? Oh, I forgot to tell you that in no province were these teams given more than six months to do this work. They were under a very strict deadline and a strict number. And as I'm sure most of you know, they came up with the number 56. So it's Depends on who you ask. They, th they call themselves Utsat. But they were placed inside the Hui by the Minzu Shirbya. So yes, of course they're a Hui group because the Minzu Shirbya says they are. They are in fact Malays. And the Hui are supposed to be Chinese-speaking Muslims, but let's put them in there. Hui became a kind of default category for Muslims who were not borderland people speaking Turkic, Persian, or Mongolian languages. So Hui, which originally meant perhaps Chinese-speaking Muslims, became a kind of catch-all Minzu term into which we could place all kinds of folk. Tibetan-speaking Muslims, Bai-speaking Muslims, Thai-speaking Muslims, Malay-speaking Muslims, they're all Hui. Here are the minorities. How many? 56. Now, a surprising number of them, I'm sure you'll notice, are represented in this poster as very colorfully dressed, attractive young females. <laughs> oh no, there's more than one exception. There are a number of males. You see the fellow shooting an arrow here. There's a fellow with a cool hat here. Another cool hat. Cowboy hat. Curly hair, blonde guy? Anybody know who that is? He's Russian. Russians are one of the Minzu. Um, there are a couple other guys, but only one old guy. Our Hui Hui. An old Ahong represents the Hui Hui. 
And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that Huihui do not dress colorfully. Minorities are supposed to dress colorfully. You may have noticed that. <laughs> I'll show you some posters that are even funnier and sadder than this. But these are the 56 minorities. And they're all very, very happy about it. <laughs> this is 1955. Notice some of us are attractive and female, but all of us are happy. And there is, of course, a Hui Hui, looking very Chinese, but we know he's a Hui Hui because he's got a white hat. We have become one great Minzu family, and this is one of the great contradictions of this theory of the Minzu. There are 56 minority Minzu plus the Han. There are 57 Minzu involved, but we are one great Minzu family. And the expression for this, I'm sure that you've, you've read in, in, in work about the Soviet Union, the notion of homo sovieticus, that all of the various nations of the Soviet Union were to come together as Soviet people, a new species of humankind. A similar idea had been voiced very early. In fact, in 1903, by the great scholar Liang Qichao, he wrote, uh, a, a, an initial essay in 03 and then a, a really summary essay in 07, creating an idea called the Zhonghua Minzu, the Chinese civilization Minzu. Now, here's where Chinese grammar comes to the aid of people like Liang Qichao. Is Chinese civilization Minzu singular or plural? Chinese has no singulars or plurals. So it could be either. The Zhonghua Minzu could be plural, 57 of them. Or it could be singular, one great Minzu family. The communist government in the 1950s chose that route. We are a single Minzu family made up of 57 different Minzu. That's a choice. It is not necessarily a description of reality. The question is, how long does it take the state to make it a description of reality, and how do they do that? And that's the story of Islam and Muslim, part of the story of Islam and Muslims under the PRC. Because Islam and Muslims are an integral part of this Minzu discourse and Minzu project of the Chinese state, which Stephen Harrell has dubbed a civilizing project. That is to say, a mission civilisatrice in the manner of the French Empire, but also a Confucian or Han civilizing project. These people are obviously barbarians because they're not like us, and our objective is to make them as much like us as possible while allowing them to remain themselves. Fascinating. 1957, again, we're almost all female and attractive. And we, the minorities, do things that Han people do not, the most obvious of which is to dress in colorful clothing and dance in a circle. We Han people do not dance in a circle, but minorities do. And over the course of the past 60 years, that element of minoritiness has been apotheosized into the single most visible aspect of the Minzu discourse in China. Colorful people dancing in a circle. I don't know how many of you have ever watched the New Year's TV special in China. It's about four hours long. It lasts from eight until midnight on New Year's Eve. And it's supposed to represent Chinese culture. And at least 50% of the variety acts in this show represent minorities, despite the fact that less than 10% of the population is made up of minorities. Why? Because they're just so colorful. And they look really good on TV. But of course, very often, the people who are doing the minority songs and dances are Han people dressed up as minorities. And this takes various forms in the People's Republic. Yes, you had a question. 
The tourist attractions. Colorful is external. The more Han-like they become, yes, of course. The more, well, let's put it, let's put it simply, the more Han-like they become, the more modern they are. Because it is the policy, the Minzu policy, that all the Minzu must follow the Han through the stages of civilization. You must remember that ideologically, though never in behavior, Ideologically, the Communist Party is committed to a singular civilizational ladder of progress. From primitive matriarchy, through slave society, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, communism. You know who invented that? Marx? Engels? An American anthropologist named Lewis Morgan invented that back in the early 19th century. And it was then copped by Engels who handed it off to Marx. And that became the only way that civilization could progress. That is what happens to everybody. So part of the Minzu Shibye, the Minzu Identification Project, was to measure at what stage each Minzu was. Some of the Minzu, like the Hui, had pretty much already caught up with the Han the Koreans too. But others were still stuck way back in slave society or even in primitive matriarchy. And that made the task of civilizing them a different one for the state. And it was a state task, obviously appearing most dramatically in education. Okay, let me continue. By 1960, the focus had changed. No longer are we simply happy female minorities. Now we are happy minorities following Chairman Mao. The centralization not only of the Chinese state around Mao Zedong, but of Chinese narratives of history around Mao Zedong has been one of the most fascinating things to follow in China over the past half century. History cannot be separated after about 1920 or 21 from that man. And so this is literally a picture of the Chinese modernization process. Follow Chairman Mao. And in this case, it's the Minzu who are following Chairman Mao. Yeah, it's Uyghur and Kazakh. Uh, it's, it's, it's Arabic alphabet. Both Uyghur and Kazakh are written with the, al with the Arabic alphabet. There's also Tibetan, uh, E, I, I can see E there, Manchu, Mongolian, uh, Chinese, of course. Uh, I can't quite figure out what this is here. But these are all the scripts that are used to write the minority languages. So this was actually aimed at minorities? Well... No. <laughs> it was aimed at Chinese to prove to them how m wonderfully multicultural their country was. This is an attempt, literally, to define China. China is a multi-ethnic society following the Chinese Communist Party and, by, by definition, the Han people into a glorious future. In the summer of 1975, the People's Liberation Army surrounded and attacked the Muslim town of Shadian in Yunnan province, where a group of local people had doggedly requested that their mosques be reopened, going as far as Beijing to present their petitions. The town's mosques had been closed as religious institutions and desecrated, their religious leaders humiliated, as part of the anti-religion activism of the great proletarian cultural revolution. The 1975 Shadian leaders based their claim on their Minzu's right to practice its religion. That is to say, it was the Minzu policy of the state on which they called to legitimize their claim to reopen their mosques. Shadian had always been a very pious town. It was a large town. Uh, it had several very good-sized mosques, a couple of them old, and they had been closed. 
in the early years of the Cultural Revolution, beginning in 66 or 67, because the Cultural Revolution denied the necessity or validity of any religious activity other than bowing to and dancing before the portrait of Mao Zedong. Over a thousand people were killed and the town leveled by artillery and heavy gunfire. The people of Shadian had armed themselves. Here's another bit of local specificity for you. The people in that part of Yunnan were renowned metalsmiths. Metalsmithing had been an important skill in that part of Yunnan for a very long time, and they made guns. Uh, I've, I've actually seen in a museum in, in southern Yunnan a remarkable example of the skill of these Muslim metalsmiths. Uh, that part of Yunnan was inside the Guomindang occupied zone during the war against Japan. And so there were a lot of Americans there. Remember, the Americans worked with the nationalists during that period and had a fair number of troops in Western China, mostly training officers for the nationalist army. And one of the Americans had had a Browning automatic uh, pistol, a, 40, a 45 caliber automatic pistol. And the, one, of the, one of the Yunnanese Muslim guys would say, hey, can I borrow your pistol? I'd love to see it. And the American officer, being an American, said, sure, here you go. Give it back to me tomorrow. They had made a precise replica of this thing. And I mean precise, a beautifully functioning Browning automatic 45 caliber pistol made by hand in one night. It's quite an extraordinary achievement. And I saw this thing in a case. The only way you could tell it wasn't a Browning automatic is that the word Browning was written backwards. <laughs> exactly. It was cast backwards because obviously these Yunnanese metalsmiths didn't know English. They didn't care. Anyway, these fellows had armed themselves. They didn't have heavy arms. They didn't have artillery, but they had weapons as, as sophisticated as light machine guns to use against the People's Liberation Army, which brought tanks and artillery and flattened the town. In the years after Mao's death, the PRC government apologized for the destruction and has invested heavily in Shadian since the early 1980s. The incident, of course, was blamed on the Gang of Four. Let's see, where's, there. That's the new mosque in Shadian, built by the Chinese state. And if you don't find irony in an atheistic communist state building mosques, you should look again. This is Chinese government money putting up this enormous new mosque for Shadian. The people are glad to have it. At that same time, just a sec, at that same time, at the time of the Shadian massacre, this was the national policy. Now we're really colorful, we're really singing and dancing, we're really all attractive and young, and we're dancing in front of Chairman Mao's portrait at Tiananmen. This is the last year before Mao's death. We sing, we dance, we wear colorful clothing. That's not what the slogans say, of course. It's just what you're looking at. Uh, one of my favorite papers on the Chinese-speaking Muslims, on the Hui, is, co is called, We Don't Sing, We Don't Dance, But We're Ethnic Anyway. <laughs> because Chinese Muslims actually don't have any colorful clothing and they don't have any dances. But that's what minorities are supposed to do. And so they're in there somewhere. I'm sure there's a Hui. I'm sure there's a Hui Hui in there somewhere. I see a sailor. Oh, my. Here, 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 I think here's a Tibetan. I can't recognize, oh, there he is. There he is, right there, right there. There he is. I knew we'd find him. Contrast these two things, this and that, which are the same year. Yes. Sorry, uh, just an observation. I, um, I, I went to Yunnan maybe six years ago. Yes. And saw this sort of spectacular dance performance in the sort of ice mountains. Yes. 
yes, yes. Is that the government money you got? Absolutely, absolutely. Remember that one of the functions of the colorful minorities is the tourist trade. It's not the only one, but that's one of them. And wherever tourists can be drawn by singing and dancing, for, an, for a cynical American, this reminds me of nothing more than the traditional Zuni snake dance every afternoon at 3 o'clock in Arizona when the tourist bus arrives. So the Japanese tourists get off the bus, they surround the Native Americans in their, in their gear who dance and sing for a while and the beat on the drum, and then the Japanese get back on the bus and go off to have lunch. Uh, that's very cynical, I recognize that, but th those of you who have traveled in minority areas of China will recognize this. It's very much put on the performance of your traditional culture for the tourists. What is traditional culture under that circumstance? It's a performance. It's a museum piece. Now, do these people still have a traditional culture about which they can be passionate and feel identification? Some do, some don't. It depends on where you are. Yes? Why do you think the, um, the new mosque that's been built, it's not very kind of traditionally Chinese or the architecture, it's very... Welcome to the world of post, welcome to the world of post 1970s China. We don't want to build Chinese style mosques. We want to build Arabic style mosques. Why? Because they're cooler. It's better, it's more attractive, it's more Muslim. No, no, local, peop local people want this style. Remember the contrasting mosques I showed you in the previous, in two, two lectures back, the old one, that beautiful old wooden building with the upturning roof, and that pretty garish Arabic style one? That's what people want. And most of the new mosques, in fact, every new mosque that I've seen, I haven't seen all the mosques, but every new mosque that I've seen has been built in this style or something like it, rather than in the old Chinese style. It's the same in the UK. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. No. Ah, sorry. This is the sort of stuff that only a sinologist could assume everybody knows. Uh, after the end of the Cultural Revolution, after Mao's death in 1976, his wife and three of her closest colleagues were arrested by the new leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. And all of the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, ten, the, the so-called 10 bad years, 10 years of really bad stuff, were blamed on those four people. They were all tried, all sentenced to death, all received suspended sentences, and all died in prison. Uh, so the Gang of Four is officially responsible for everything bad that happened in the Cultural Revolution, including the massacre at Shadian, which incidentally, as far as I know, nobody's been able to penetrate to the interior of the Central Committee to get this, but as far as anybody knows, that massacre was ordered by Deng Xiaoping. This is how the Cultural Revolution is supposed to look in Xinjiang, and this, of course, is how it actually looked. Xinjiang, of course, has to be taken into consideration now that we're into, into the People's Republic period. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm apparently moving way too slowly. What else is new? Um, but Xinjiang and the Uyghurs come into the discourse of incorporation and integration in a way that they never had before. The Qing had never attempted to change the culture of the Uyghurs. They left them pretty much alone. As long as the Begs weren't so hopelessly corrupt that the people rebelled, they left Xinjiang pretty much alone. But not the People's Republic. The People's Republic is a modern state. And modern states are bent to some extent, high, highly variable of course, on integration. That's what modern states do. The People's Republic of China is no exception. And so the integration of Xinjiang into the Chinese state has been a major task 
and one that remains unfinished to this day. Look at the Sino-Muslim, the Hui people on the next slide. Some are pious Muslims, but at least one professes himself an atheist. Most do not eat pork, but at least one almost certainly does. One is a university professor, one an imam. Some of the men wear white hats, but some do not. One is a vice minister of the People's Republic of China's government. Some of them wear modern clothing, but some do not. At least one is a committed Sufi who spends part of each day reading the Masnavi of Jalal ad-Din Ru Muhammad Rumi, a huge religious poem written in Persian. Some of the women cover their ha hair, but some do not. What do they all have in common? The answer to the question, of course, is that they are all members of the Hui Minzu. People could not be more different from one another than these people are. I'm particularly fond of this one. This is my teacher, Yang Huaizhong, who is the dude who reads the Masnavi in Persian. Uh, a remarkable old Sufi, one of the greatest teachers I've ever known, an extraordinarily deep scholar of the history of Islam in China. The fellow in the middle, of course, is a member of the Central Committee. The family on the left is an upwardly mobile, urban, Hui family. You'll note some hats, some not hats, some women covered, some women not covered. Here we have a more orthodox family in a frontier region. There, a, uh, a poorer family in a village, and of course, an old imam. These are all Hui. But that's pretty much where it ends. Some practice Islam, some do not. Some think of Islam as an intellectual discipline, some as a spiritual discipline, and some simply as, an, as a minzu identification. More diversity. Compare these to the Hui faces. These are all Uyghurs. And if you've ever spent time in Turkey, you recognize most of them. These people are clearly Turks. They are not, in any sense of the word, except citizenship, Chinese. But they are all citizens of the People's Republic of China. By virtue of the Qing Incorporation in 1759. Without that, they would never have been citizens of China. This mosque you've seen before, this is the Xi'an Great Mosque, this is the prayer hall. This is the contemporary style about which you ask. This is a new one. This is the style that most people are, are interested in having uh, in mosque building now. And there has been an enormous spate of a flood of mosque building since the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1978. Tens of thousands of new mosques have been built in China over the past 40 years. Contrast these two. On the left, a Hui mosque. On the right, a Uyghur mosque. And they don't go to one another's mosques. In part because the sermon is given in Chinese on the left and in Uyghur on the right. And they wouldn't understand it. The prayers, of course, are the same. Only Hui pray in the one, only Uyghurs in the other. This is the largest mosque in China. It's in Kashgar, as far from Beijing as you can possibly get. Uh, this is simply the gate. The mosque itself, like so many Central Asian mosques, is open air. And 10,000 people can pray there on Eid. And they do. Some Muslim neighborhoods in China, Kunming and Shenyang, have been raised as part of urban renewal. Their historic mosques destroyed and their people scattered to the suburbs. Some Muslim neighborhoods, Zhengzhou and Xi'an, for example, have been preserved with their mosques, despite pressure to tear them down. Some neighborhoods have been destroyed, but their historic mosques preserved as tourist attractions, Kashgar, for example, and Beijing. What do you think might differentiate these different fates for urban Muslims in today's China? And the answer turns out to be the skill of their leaders. The Xi'an and Zhengzhou communities developed internal institutions that were legal inside the People's Republic of China, what are called 
folk institutions to negotiate with the authorities. They failed to do so in Kunming and Shenyang, Beijing or Kashgar, and their Muslim quarters were destroyed. This is Kashgar's old quarter in the process of being destroyed. What, what's behind it is now what the entire old quarter looks like. The whole center of Kashgar is gone. Yes, yes. But it's not just their cities. I mean, the whole of Kashgar, all of the, all of the cities have changed. Oh, absolutely. The, the, the difference is that, that the Muslim quarters were always identifiable and particularly the necessity for Muslims to live near the mosque. To destroy the old mosques literally means to destroy community. And those, the communities that have negotiated successfully, like Zhengzhou and Xi'an, have done so on the basis of their minzu consanguinity and necessity to be together. They persuaded the city administration to leave the historic mosques alone and allow the Muslims to live around them in new housing, mind you but uh, not to move them to the suburbs, which is what has happened in Beijing and Shenyang, in Kunming. In Kunming, there were five historic mosques in the old Muslim quarter. They're all gone. They didn't even move them. They simply tore them down. This is the kind of violence that can erupt in Xinjiang. Xinjiang is a very tense place. We can talk about that if we have time later. These are Uyghurs. You'll notice that they're not all happy. That's a problem. The posters don't describe reality. They describe the way the Communist Party wants people to think. Oh yes, the minorities, they're very happy. They get extra points on the entrance exams and they get to have an extra child in the population control program. Lucky devils. Well, some Uyghurs don't think so. Yeah. The population of Muslims in China has increased slightly faster than the Han population, but not much. Because the Hui Muslims, who are the majority of, of, of Chinese, of Muslims in the People's Republic, have been urban and already controlling their own population for a very long time, uh, and they're very education oriented, they haven't increased at any greater speed than the Han population. Uyghurs have increased slightly faster. There are about 9 million Hui and somewhere between 8 and 9 million Uyghurs in China. And there we are. Cheers. Uh, thanks for the lecture. I, sure. There's just one of the individuals that I wanted to ask about. Of course. Um, one of the mod modernist figures mm -hmm. which you uh, showed, not in the last mm -hmm. lecture, the one before, yes. uh, late mm -hmm. 19th century, yes. who went to Azhar and came back with a very... Oh, he's, he's, he's actually early 20th century, Ma Jian. Ma Jian. Yes. Do you know what were his influences whilst he was at Azhar, whilst he was studying? Was he, was he... There in the, he was there in the 1920s. Hmm. And therefore, uh, Egyptian-style Muslim modernism Rashid of, the, of, the, of the Rashid Rida oh. variety. In fact, I'm, I'm going to hear this spring a new paper by a, a scholar of, Islamic, of Egyptian Islamic history in the States who has discovered a correspondence between Rashid Rida and a Chinese Muslim Ahong in Arabic that was uh, conducted in the pages of Almanar uh, during the 1920s, the Chinese Ahong, whose name was Ma Tu, asked Almanar for a fatwa, Rashid Rida for a fatwa on the subject of whether or not Chinese, China can be considered Dar al-Islam. Can China be considered the territory of Islam or must it be considered the territory of the sword? And Rashid Rida's response, from what I know, I haven't heard this paper yet, it's just we've been emailing and I'm, I'm tremendously provoked by his answer. Rashid Rida, in, in summary, according to this scholar, said, it's Dar al-Harb, but you're very lucky it is because you're going to be able to make a lot of money. Uh, 
<laughs> which I think is a riot. But, <laughs> but I can't wait to hear this paper because one of the things that we don't know very much about is the ability of Chinese Muslim scholars to write in and especially to correspond in Arabic. So we have a panel at a conference this March in California with five papers on Chinese Muslims and the Arabic language. Uh, one young fella has been up in Linxia, in, in Old Khejo, this Muslim center in southern Gansu, uh, looking, attending Muslim schools and looking at the different ways in which Sharia is taught in these Muslim schools, whether in Arabic or in Chinese, but particularly the role of the Arabic language in understanding Islamic law, which I think is going to be fascinating. So we've got five papers on Chinese Muslims and Arabic. It would be equally fascinating to have a panel on Chinese Muslims and Persian, because though Chinese Muslims that I know of never wrote in Persian, they read Persian texts. And they've been particularly implicated in Sufi writings, but also in the education of Chinese Muslim women. Persian has been particularly important. It's an institution of which I have spoken hardly at all. In fact, I haven't mentioned it. In, North, in the North China Plain, in the, beginning in the 18th century, began to appear this very peculiar institution of women's mosques. That a conventional mosque would have next to it a smaller physical building which was reserved for the education and prayers of women. And that institution, which is considered, I'm told, very odd, has actually spread. And you can now find it as far afield as Yunnan, Gansu. There are conventional mosques with women's mosques attached in which sometimes, but not always, women lead the prayers uh, for the other women. And the education, apart from liturgical Arabic, is largely in Persian texts. So there are all kinds of work remaining to be done, not just on contemporary China, but on the past as well. Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you very much for the sure. lecture. I've enjoyed it very much. My question to you is, why are you not a Muslim? Why am I not a Muslim? Um, that's rather a personal question now, isn't it? Um, why am I not a Muslim? Boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> let, me, let, me, uh, let me give you a, a linguistic derivation. In Jewish tradition, in which I was raised, a person who becomes an apostate, who rejects the tradition, particularly the practice, is called an apikoros, an epicurean. I'm an Epicurean. I, I find the, the, the texts of people like Lucretius, Durerum Natura, and some of the other ancient Greek philosophers to be the most persuasive descriptions of reality I know. I am, however, literally riveted by religion and how people practice it. And so my, my upbringing as a relatively strict in a relatively strict and pious Jewish household has given me the experience of the practice of religion and my academic training has given me distance. If I didn't have the distance, and this is really the answer to your question, if I didn't have the distance, if I were in fact a Muslim, I don't think I could do this work. So I guess that's an answer. Yes. Uh, I was wondering what, what is the Islamic sort of learning, the sort of traditional Islamic learning in China itself? Is it seen as something prestigious to go abroad and to um, Arab countries to study? Or is there a good indigenous sort of okay. tradition? Uh, again, it depends on when. Okay. Uh, Jing Tang Jiao Yu, the scripture hall tradition developed in the 16th and 17th centuries precisely because Muslims couldn't go anywhere else to study. Uh, they couldn't go to Xinjiang even because of the Ming prohibitions on travel. As things opened up after the Qing conquest, the Sufis could come and go, and it was possible to go to the Middle East, and it was exceedingly prestigious to do so, because the majority of people who went didn't survive. It was very dangerous out there. That's one of the things they don't talk about with the European exploring ships, 
of all the glories of the discovery of the world, 1492 and so on, about a third of those ships didn't make it. And all the people drowned. It was not safe. So people who went and came back had great prestige, especially if they had undertaken study in the Middle East, in Arabic and Persian, and brought back with them authentic texts. Remember, in Chinese culture, the power of text. It's true in Islamic cultures all over the world, but it's doubly true in China, where texts hold such great power. These guys, many of them brought back texts. As I, as I think I mentioned before, one of my current projects is about such a text, a text that was brought back to China in the beginning or middle, of, early half of the 18th century and became very powerful in these internecine quarrels amongst Sufis, but which no modern scholar had ever read. So I found a copy and read it. And that's the sort of thing that keeps me going. I love it. So the power of returned pilgrims and returned texts was indeed very great because there were so few of them. Currently, very large numbers of pilgrims can go on the Hajj, but it's usually a 10-day journey. And it's prestigious, yes, to be, to be a Hajji. In, especially in Uyghur country, out in Xinjiang, Hajis very often change their lives radically. They stop smoking. They stop drinking. They stop horsing around the way young people do, and they become adults, essentially, by virtue of the Hajj. Um, they become more respected members of their communities, but it's not the same thing as going abroad for learning. Many of the Chinese Muslims, the Hui that I, that I know in places like Xi'an and Landro, these are big city people, they're, they, they're, they're shopkeepers and so on, have spent considerable amounts of time in the Middle East doing commerce. Uh, one of my favorite uh, shopkeepers in Xi'an keeps a small photography shop, spent four years in Libya under Gaddafi, doing business, came back with excellent Arabic. And so he's still doing business, he runs a photography shop, but he's very much in demand at the mosque to teach the children because his Arabic is just so good. So there's a wide variety of possibilities for learning, some of it secular, simply language, but others really coming back with deep religious study, and that is very prestigious. On the other hand, and this is a very complex business that, again, I haven't mentioned for lack of time. Madrasa education in China is now largely under the control of the state. It's very dicey to, be, to try to be an imam, an ahong in China, without having gone through one of the state-mandated madrasa. Uh, their education is planned by the state. It is, ortho, it is orthodox, but it is also patriotic. So one must do patriotic education as well as Islamic education. So to have an Islamic education outside the purview of the Chinese state, for a Hui can be very prestigious, for a Uyghur can be very dangerous. More. Oh, sir. Professor, um, I think uh, you deserve a big thanks for a very stimulating oh, day. So do all of you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the course has obviously focused on um, the Muslims in China yes. as a minority with all this history. Yes. And I think you mentioned that since the end of uh, the Cultural Revolution in China, there has been a relaxation uh, towards, uh, towards the, the Hui, towards the Hui, and so on. not the Uyghurs. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, because I've been to China a number of times on business and so on, mm -hmm. and I had contacts at the university level. Uh, uh, um, so my understanding, a uh, question is about how does the state, uh, what's the state's attitude towards other religious minorities, mm -hmm. especially in terms of missionary work yes. and having places of worship, and if you could p put it briefly in their kind of historical context. Other religious minorities. Well, Thank you. Part, of the, part of the problem lies uh, for other religious groups, especially Christians, of course, in the, the, the processes by which Islam has become an indigenous religion. That is, Islam is a Chinese religion and has been for the past 500 years, perhaps. So that Islam, the Muslims, especially the Hui, are Chinese and they belong there. 
So how they are handled would be very, very different from how foreign missionaries and their converts would be handled. As I'm sure you know, some kinds of Christianity are okay, some kinds of Christianity are not. There are two, for example, two Roman Catholic churches in China. There's the nationally approved one, in which the bishops and the priests are ordained by the state. And then there's the Roman one, which is not approved of and which is underground. There are legitimate Protestant churches in China which belong to the National Christian Protestant Church Association and are approved by the state. And then there are the so-called house churches which are underground, illegal, and uh, tend to be evangelical. Uh, I don't know what the Chinese state is doing about Mormons these days, but there are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of missionaries, but the approval of them and their ability to function goes up and down. Obviously, before the end of the Cultural Revolution, before 1978, nothing. Even to practice the slightest bit of Christianity would have been, if not life-threatening, at least threatening to your freedom. Since 78, there has been an opening. There are more Christians, lots more Christians. But they are always associated with foreigners, whereas Hui Muslims are not. And this is crucial. Hui Muslims are Chinese. Uyghurs are not. They live in China. They are citizens of China, but they are not Chinese. And so the ways in which Hui and Uyghurs are treated are really quite different. The institutions are very much the same. That is, Hui Muslim, Muslims have to go to a state madrasa to become an imam, so do Uyghurs. But the numbers of people who can go and where they can go is far more constrained for Uyghurs than it is for Hui. I've been in, in Hui mosques. In fact, I've lectured in Hui mosques to the little children. Nothing can be more fun than that. Oh my, what a delight uh, to be in the, in the Islamic school with the little children and to teach them about Judaism. <laughs> we had so much, doing comparative religion. It was so much fun, even starting with greetings. You know, you say salam aleikum, we say shalom aleichem. Guess what? Same words. Look, I'll write them on the board for you and you can see. We had a great time. And these are kids of seven and eight. Every mosque in Xinjiang, has a sign over the front gate saying, no one under 18 may enter here. And the sign is in Uyghur. Because it is illegal to teach religion to anyone under 18 years of age. And that's true all over China. It's ignored for the Hui. It is not ignored for the Uyghurs. So, the answers are so various that it's impossible to give a single one. But I think detailed local study is going to lead us in some to some fascinating insights into how Christianity, Islam, even Buddhism come under the purview of the state. Uh, just let me, let me give you a Buddhist example. Uh, Buddhism is just fine in China. Buddhism is a Chinese religion, uh, lots of Buddhist temples, Buddhist monks, and so on, but not in Tibet. Tibet is a problem. Buddhism is just fine. Buddhism is a Chinese religion. It's okay, but not Falun Gong. Falun Gong is poison. Why? Not because it's Buddhist, but because it has been deemed by the state to be political. And it is crushed whenever it appears. So it varies tremendously. Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Roman Catholicism are legal in China. It's enshrined in the Constitution, except when they're not. And that's the problem. Sir? Yeah, it's just... Uh, uh, it, it's not going to broadcast, it's just for the, for okay. the recording. Um, yeah, just, just want to uh, understand that when Islam came to China yes. by land, my understanding, but was, was there any evidence also through the sea route uh, oh, from, from Yemen? And oh, so yes, on? absolutely. There's no question that Muslims came to China and established mosques and communities, both on the landward side in places like Xi'an, Xi'an and Kaifeng, and, and Lanzhou, and in Quanzhou, Yangzhou, Guangzhou, 
on the southeast coast. So we can find, in fact, probably the oldest mosques in China are not in the northwest or along the, the landside Silk Road, but on the seaside maritime route to the Persian Gulf, India, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea. So that the answer is absolutely yes. What has happened over the history that I've tried to talk about today is that the landward side communities have pers persisted in ways that the seaward side communities have not, largely because of Ming Dynasty policy vis-a-vis -vis communication with the outside. One last, piece, last two, please. When was the call to prayer stopped officially? Oh, it was, the call to prayer has never been officially stopped. In, in some communities, it was stopped because neighborhood groups found it annoying and complained. And processes were negotiated by which it could be sent out, for example, by cell phone. Um, one of my favorite stories comes from Yinchuan in Ningxia province. There the, uh, the call was made through a recorded, a recorded loudspeaker system from the top of the tower. And the neighbors, who were, many of whom were not Muslims, were exceedingly annoyed by this, especially by the first call at dawn. The first call at dawn can be exceedingly annoying if you're not a Muslim. <laughs> what are those people on about? It's awfully noisy, and it's 5 o'clock in the morning. So a process of negotiation was undertaken between the leadership of the mosque, the local neighborhood association, and the city government. City government came in to mediate it, which is their job, and it was successful. Four calls to prayer were allowed, but the earliest one was not. And so people had to set their alarm clocks for the first prayer. But after that, the call to prayer was allowed. Oh, oh yes, absolutely, absolutely, no question. The, 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 the call to prayer from the tower was absolutely conventional because remember, up at least until the Ming, Muslims lived in separate quarters. And so by, they surrounded the mosque. Everybody who lived near the mosque was a Muslim. And so the call was not a problem. One of the reasons that the call to prayer was a problem in this community in Yinchuan is that the mosque, in order to keep a financial... Uh, advantage and some stability in their budgeting had built high-rise houses, large apartment buildings around the mosque. They were owned by the mosque as vakf. They were common property as endowment. But many of the residents were non-Muslims. And so there were a lot of non-Muslims living right next to the mosque. So it was rather a problem at five o'clock in the morning. But they solved it. But they said that the, the, the five o'clock call, we won't do. But after that, no problem. Yes, final question. Um, so firstly, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I understand there's a, um, there are actually Chinese Jews in China, a very small community now, but back in the day there were back maybe in the day. more. Yes. Did the paths of Muslims and Jews cross? Look, Chinese Muslims and Chinese Indeed Jews. Indeed they did. Yeah. Uh, we know an awful lot about this little tiny community of Jews. We know that there were communities of Jews in several cities, but we only know something about one of them, and that's Kaifeng. The Kaifeng Jewish community lasted about a thousand years as a coherent Jewish community with a synagogue. That is a very long time. But by the middle of the 18th century, it was fading. Fewer and fewer people could read the texts by the middle of the 19th century, there was one old woman who could read Hebrew. She was Chinese. Well, they were all Chinese. They were all Chinese. They were like the Muslims. Yeah. And indeed, what happened to them is that gradually, these Jews became Muslims. Because there was a local Muslim community which was much larger. Mm -hmm. And in order to find spouses for their children, in order to have a larger context, these people had been there for a thousand years having very little contact with the Am Yisrael, which is the equivalent of the Islamic Ummah. Ummah and Am are the same word. Just like Shalom Aleichem and Salam ale Salam Aleikum. I could give you a little comparative religion lesson if you like. Uh, the, the Jews 
had lost because of their tiny number and their location all contact with any other Jews and so the community basically died. By the end of the 19th century there was nobody left who was religiously in any sense a Jew. They had all either faded into the general Han community around them or they had become Muslims. The reason to become a Muslim of course is to continue the pork avoidance. Um, and I, I, you know, this is, this is again a little bit of the question before about why I'm not a Muslim. Islam and Judaism resemble one another to a truly remarkable degree. And for the Jews of Kaifeng to convert to Islam was nothing like as great a leap as to become Han. Now, in the Minzu Shubia in the 1950s, if the Hui are able to be a Minzu by virtue of their descent from foreign Muslims, why weren't the Jews able to be a Minzu by virtue of their descent from foreign Jews? And the answer is there weren't any left. There was simply nobody there. What's happened since 1978 in Kaifeng is fascinating. The descendants of these Jews have reappeared and are now tourist guides for foreign Jewish, Jewish tourists who come to see the old synagogue site. There's nothing left there, but there is a site. And so when Jewish tourists come, these folks come and say, I am a Jew, which in genealogical terms is correct, but not in Jewish religious terms because Jew Jewish religious identity is matrilineal. And these folks being Chinese are all tracing their ancestry through the, through the paternal line. Uh, but the community did exist. We know a lot about it. I've actually translated one of their texts and published it. Uh, one, the, the earliest comprehensive text that we have about Judaism from Kaifeng is a stone inscription from 1489, a Ming Dynasty stone inscription. I've translated that in a collection. Uh, it's a fascinating document, very similar in some ways to the Khan Kitab, although much shorter, of course. It's just a stone inscription, not a book. But what little we know about the Jews of Kaifeng is very well known. That is, it's been overstudied. But I'll be glad to give you references anytime you want. Are we done? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs>